Thank you, uh, Brad. It's, this is a real honor. Uh, and I'm just looking at the chat. It is amazing, uh, the group of people you have here together. As I was saying um, earlier, I have a, a few friends that have done this, and they've spoken very highly of it. And it's uh, it's quite an honor to be asked to do it. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, can everybody see and hear me okay? You know, just anybody give me a thumbs up. Uh, I guess Abrat would tell me if not, that's good. Uh, I'm trying this thing. I, I've done this a few times where I do this little thing. It's kind of cool. If you want to do this, go on Zoom. Uh, you do advanced under share uh, screen, and then you can uh, do it. Uh, use slides as virtual background, and then you can make yourself like huge or small. I'm going to keep myself down here in the corner. Uh, it just kind of gives a little bit more of a feel of like a real presentation. But um, I'm more than happy to ditch this and just do a QA. and a And the other thing I'll say is like, I really, um, I'm scared. I'm blocked off for two hours for this. Uh, so I anticipate doing this for about an hour, take a little break, come back. Um, I don't care if I don't get past this slide, quite honestly. Um, I have a presentation. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to go through it, of course, but I really do not mind and far, far prefer that you interrupt me with questions, comments, thoughts um, as we're doing this. Uh, I would much rather have a conversation than present things. I, I, like I was, I was saying earlier, if you were here, like um, I had a friend, we were at a conference last week and he was like, yeah, we were, it was interesting because they gave everybody... Um, Gosh, I don't want to throw you, but they gave everybody 45 minutes of time and they said, you can do whatever you want with that time. And he and I both spoke for about 20 minutes and then wanted to do Q&A for the majority of the time. And some people like just talk the whole time. It's like 45 minutes. I'm getting through these slides. And we were both just like, why would you do that? Like, who cares? Like, I could stand here and present these slides in my office and, uh, you know, and not hear anything from you guys. And it would have been like the exact same experience. So there's no point. I know what my slides say. I know what I'm going to say. So again, please interrupt, ask any questions. Uh, what I'm generally going to talk about today is writing um, as a practice, as a discipline, um, totally stealing um, the title from Stephen King, uh, one of my, uh, which is just pretty brazen, because I, I would argue he's the, the greatest writer of our lifetime. You may not like horror, you may not like fantasy, uh, doesn't matter. He's a great writer. Um, and if you haven't read his book on writing, I, I would urge you to get hold of it. It's enormously entertaining. Um, and it, it is the best book other than Strunk and White that I know of about writing. I mean, it it just, and, and that's the thing I think a lot of times we don't talk about in this discipline. And we don't talk about with PhD students is that the job is writing. Um, if you don't like writing, you need to learn to do it as a craft or a chore that you that you um, that you just gotta get done. And if you do like writing, great, nurture that, find time for it, figure out how to um, how to make sure you don't lose that love of writing because it'll serve you well throughout your career. And I'm going to talk about that in the and I was asked to talk about grounded theory. So sort of. Um, within that topic, I'm going to talk about grounded theory. I was going to go through an example of a paper we published using grounded theory at AMJ and sort of the story of that. And the, the broader message about this is sort of um, when you're doing qualitative research, in particular grounded theory, but all qualitative research and really all quantitative research too. Um, well, I'd say more so in qualitative. I do both. So I think I can say this with some confidence. Like it's harder to find the pathway through and to persist with a qualitative project sometime um, because it's there's no there's no real recipe there's no other test you can run there's no like thing you can do to solve the problem quantitatively or statistically it's like you've got to tell a better story uh, and you've got to tell a story that people believe and so it's hard. Uh, I think they're equally hard to publish. I don't think it's harder to publish qualitative work, but I do think it's more time consuming to publish qualitative work. It just inherently takes more time um, to do those projects. Now that said, they're my favorite projects. And they, you know, if you look at the data, uh, I think I shared some readings on this, but there's, you know, tons of evidence that the most influential paper, empirical papers are qualitative papers over time. Why? Because they're the ones that come up with the new interesting ideas and, and also the ones people love to read because they're just interesting. They're telling a story. Okay. 
cool. So any questions before we get started? Uh, that's where I was planning to go today. If that sounds like what you wanted to hear about, great. If it doesn't, then, you know, maybe go get a coffee, come back, see if you think it's interesting or do something better with your time. I don't know. All right. Cool. Please, please interrupt me. All right. Now, uh, now can I actually work the slides? Okay, cool. So I'm going to go through a little background about myself. Uh, I do have a reason for doing this. Uh, don't think I'm just a narcissist. Uh, so I was born in uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi. Um, anybody on the chat ever been to Vicksburg, Mississippi? I bet not. Probably not. Nope. No one's saying anything. Good. Well, good. You're not missing a whole hell of a lot, quite honestly. Uh, my earliest memories of Vicksburg are being bit by mosquitoes. Um, and so that's my great grandmother. She lived to be like 105 up there. I'm not going to live that long. Probably. When I was young, we moved from uh, Vicksburg to uh, Advance, North Carolina. I see somebody from Charlotte. He might know where Advance is, maybe. Uh, Advance is a small unincorporated community outside Winston-Salem. Uh, I really wanted to be a skateboarder and most of the roads were dirt roads. So that was really hard. That's why I'm skating in my living room there in that picture. And I also really, uh, hey, all right, another person in Charlotte. Uh, so um, I, I really didn't like it there. <laughs> um, no offense, it's a lovely place, but a lot of rednecks. And, uh, and I just, I, I wanted to be anything that wasn't there. So the other thing I aspired to be was a hippie. So there I am, in my tie dye hat and my fake joint trying to be a hippie in grade school. Um, I went off to college, became a real hippie, uh, followed the Grateful Dead around, uh, did a degree in journalism. Uh, the guy right, I uh, saw so he's right here, his name's Conrad Fink, uh, my favorite professor I had at the University of Georgia. Uh, he was worked for the Associated Press until his retirement, uh, Fink of the AP. He was the best writer I ever had as a teacher because um, he wrote for newspapers. And newspaper writing has to be succinct, clear, concise, who, what, when, where, why. But Fink like also emphasized the artistry of it. And he would like, you know, ex he would like read everything we wrote in the student paper. And then he'd be like, what do we have today? Uh, York wrote some dribble. Let's see. And then he would like analyze our writing in front of everybody, which is actually really good for you as a young writer, because like, you're, you're getting a thicker skin and you're learning critiques. Um, that's my fake ID I got made at Georgia. Uh, I made myself uh, uh, made myself exactly one month older than I was because I was nervous and gave him the wrong birth date. I won't go into this other picture. Some people celebrating things. Anyway, uh, eventually I graduated. Um, I got offered a job writing obituaries for a small town in Georgia. <laughs> it's like uh like man that seems like a real i did it for about a week or two i was like this is really boring <laughs> like because it was a small town not that many people died so the rest of the time i was just basically a uh administrative assistant i was like you know loading copiers and writing stuff uh but i did have a good camera and i did have training in photojournalism so i i saw an advertisement to go take photos for a whitewater rafting company and that sounded infinitely more fun that was on the border of north carolina and tennessee on the uh, pigeon river so went there, did photos, uh, ended up going guiding down in Australia uh, during the off season, came back and got an opportunity to help start up a uh, whitewater rafting company on the same river. Uh, and that was my first um, taste of entrepreneurship. Any of you guys ever been whitewater rafting? Show of hands. People have been whitewater rafting. Yeah. Okay. I see Kathy's been. Nobody. Oh, not Christina. Okay. So the picture in the middle, the guide's supposed to be in the back of the road of the boat. Uh, that's where the guide sits. Uh, there I am in the middle in the yellow helmet. That was my first trip in Australia where I almost killed a bunch of people. Those are other guys jumping into the boat to try to save us. Uh, Australia has no liability laws, apparently, at least in the whitewater rafting industry, because we were running like this class five plus river with a bunch of people that didn't speak English. It was all like Asian tourists and uh it was a disaster. We had daily evacuations. It was really fun. Uh, also extremely dangerous. And then, uh, so we started this company. That was my first taste of entrepreneurship. And uh, interestingly, when we started the company, we bought um, an empty elementary school. It's a little town uh, called Hartford on the border of Tennessee and North Carolina. And we were able to buy the elementary school. And it was like, you know, that's kind of weird. Why are we able to buy the elementary school? Um, and it turns out everybody that uh, had kids had moved away from there. And they were like, well, why did that happen? And it turns out that this uh, company, the Champion Paper Company in North Carolina, had been dumping uh, dachshunds into the river for the past 
25, 30 years. And it, basically we were in the middle of a cancer cell. Now the dioxins have been cleaned up, but there was still like effluent coming to the river, really making it uh, pretty gross. Hey, you've been whitewater rafting on the pigeon. Go Deborah. Uh, did you fall out at Lost Sky? I hope not, because there's a nasty hole there. That was the big, uh, the big rapid Lost Sky. And it's called that because the guides would fall out the back and go in the hole and get recirculated and beat up. Happened all the time. All right, nice Alabama person. So, um, so anyway, I got involved in like this. This is where I really I started to have this idea of like, huh? So this environmental pollution is keeping us as entrepreneurs from having a thriving business. Obviously our business would be better off without the river looking like the color of this like tea I'm drinking. That would be better if the water was clearer uh, and clean looking. And, you know, I'm not sure I trust these guys anyway. Am I actually exposing people to disease? I don't know. Am I myself getting exposed to disease? So I started working with a couple of local NGOs, uh, started to speak at like, you know, legal proceedings and trying to get the river cleaned up, which we utterly failed at, uh, thanks to then Governor Al Gore of North Carolina, granting them a variance, which is also kind of interesting and ironic. So I was doing this and um, I got more interested in the entrepreneurship and business side than I was in the whitewater rafting. Um, and I decided to go back and um, do my MBA, went to the University of Tennessee uh, in Knoxville, did my MBA there, um, was going to start a craft brewery, but it was really, it was like right around 1998, it was the height of the dot-com boom, and like I was getting offered multiple jobs with a bigger signing bonus than I had made in my entire career <laughs> up until that point. It was kind of amazing. It was a it, May, may all of you be lucky enough to live in, in great financial times at some point in your life. It was a crazy, heady kind of time because there was just so much money. And so I got hired by a company called Capital One, the What's in Your Wallet people. I think I was about the 50th employee. And I was uh, the head of the internet team. Yeah, so I knew how to do HTML. So I worked there for like five years. Uh, I was kind of climbing the corporate ladder. Uh, but I was pretty unhappy, um, mostly because I decided the company was, I, I think the company is now a real bank. At the time, it was very much a startup serving, we basically invented the underserved market in financial services. Uh, if you're a little more sophisticated, what that basically means is lending money to people that have no business borrowing the money and are uneducated and charging them really exorbitant rates on very high balances so we can make lots of money and mathematically and statistically modeling how to do that. Pretty evil. Um, so I didn't feel real good about myself. I spent all my weekends uh, running whitewater rafting trips or not. I, oh, this isn't going to work. It's a video of me kayaking. Let's see if we can get All right. Well, I spent all my time running whitewater rivers. Eventually, I broke my neck. I was laid up in a cast for six months. Couldn't go anywhere. That's my wife approving of my you know rehabilitation regimen. Um, I had a lot of time to think. And I was like, man, what am I doing? Like, I do not want to go to my grave saying I helped uh, you know, extort people with credit cards. And so I was lucky enough at the time um, to get accepted into an exec ed program at the Darden School at University of Virginia. And um, there were a couple of professors there. It was a class on leadership. And they actually forced us to do these reflection exercises on what are you doing? How, and the basic thesis of this, I thought was pretty strong, actually, is how do you expect to lead people if you don't know exactly what you're trying to achieve? And I took it really seriously because I was pretty damn unhappy. And so I was like, well, it seems like these professors have a pretty sweet gig. Um, and so I started talking to uh, Venkat, uh, Sinker and Venkataraman, one of the entrepreneurship professors. And I was like, you know, I think I'd like to be a professor. He's like, oh, really? Okay. Um, why is that? I'm like, well, it seems like you guys have a really good gig here. You, know, you teach these classes, you do some consulting, you make a lot of money, you work in a beautiful place. He's like, well, what do you know about research? And I was like, well, you mean what scientists do? And he's like, yeah, well, we do that too. We like to think of ourselves sort of as scientists. I'm like, really? That seems kind of bogus, but sure, whatever. And he is like, well, I'll tell you what, uh, why don't you read this and talk to me tomorrow if you're still interested? He gave me a copy of the Journal of Business Venturing. And I was like, right, what the hell is this thing? Like, So anyway, I went back to my little hotel room and I was serious. Like I needed a direction. I needed something. So I sat down and made myself read it all. I came back the next day at breakfast and Ben Katz like, well, what'd you think of that? I'm like, well, I didn't understand a lot of it. Um, I thought some of it was God awful boring. Uh, and I thought a lot of it was pretty interesting. And I thought all of it was more interesting than what I currently do for a job. He's like, well, it's a pretty good answer. Um, so from there we developed a friendship and, and I ended up going there and doing my PhD. So, uh, 
my wife being the wise woman she was or is uh, became an entrepreneur because I was like, hey, I, I, I found new meaning. I'm going to get my PhD. I'm going to do a second career and I'm going to quit my job and we should have kids. And uh, this upper picture is not all of my kids. Um, thank God. My wife started a birth dual business and she was an entrepreneur the whole time I was in school, helping bring kids into the world without, you know, hospitals and medication. And then these two are my kids. They're now 16, 16, 15. They're not nearly that cute anymore. Uh, they're a lot more sulky and angry as anybody as teenagers will tell you. Uh, and I taught myself to play the mandolin and joined a bunch of bluegrass bands. So I, I basically changed my whole life around this idea of being an academic. And I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do and what I really thought and what I really wanted to study was this intersection of entrepreneurship and sustainability. Now, at the time, there were like two people in the world that had written anything in any kind of reputable journal about that idea. Uh, one was named Andrea Larson. She was at Darden. The other one was named Tom Dean, and he was here at Colorado. And I got accepted here at Colorado to do my PhD, but I was like, I came here. I'd never been to Boulder, and I was like, man, I love it here. I want to work here, so I'm not going to do my PhD there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do my PhD at this place and then try to come back here. And all the people at Colorado are like, yeah, 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 whatever. That's fine. And I'm really, really uh, fortunate and, and blessed that that worked out. <laughs> It was a lot of work too, actually. I made it work out to a large extent. All right, uh, that's just more stuff. What we do here in Colorado, fun stuff. Uh, oh, my son took up skateboarding. He's uh, he's really good. Uh, of course, recently he's got more into biking. So fulfilled my legacy. Uh, I started skateboarding again. Uh, you can't see the video, unfortunately, but I skate. My undergrads say, how is it possible for someone to skateboard that slowly, York? Um, we do a lot of outdoor stuff. We play a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. That's the other thing we've been doing in recent years. And this video isn't going to work either. But in um, 2013, we were impacted by this, this flood here. And uh, I'd been thinking about climate change when I was doing my PhD even and then more. But uh, yeah, that was, that was actually not Garden of the Gods. That was in, um, that one is in a slot canyon in Utah, but the name escapes me right now. Wow. Los Rios outside. That's cool. Hey, if any of you guys ever want me to come give a talk at your school and take me rafting, I'm I'm down. I'll bring my kayak actually. And just go. Uh, anyhow, so um, we had this amazing like hundred year flood here, and this is where. Um, okay, Joel has a quick question. Uh, love to hear what you did to make the getting back to your dream school idea. Right. Okay, sure, I can talk about that, Joel. No problem. Um, so what I did was. Uh, no, it's outside. It's it's uh, more near uh, Glen Canyon. Um, so. Um, um what is the name of that place Perea canyon it's a it's an amazing canyon that's what that picture was i'll go back to it it's awesome you got you backpack in with everything you hike through a slot canyon for three days and there's no other way out it's really cool uh highly recommend Perea canyon to anyone that can ever make it there um so what did i do to get my dream job at this school well so what i did was first of all i um when i turned them down I, was, I told them straight up, like, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to come there for my PhD because I really want to work here. And they were like, oh, nice line, Jeff, whatever. You know, I mean, that's, that sounds like a really nice way to turn someone down for a PhD slot, right? But I was like, no, I'm, I'm dead serious. And so um, what I did is I, I, I went to their social at the Academy of Management every year. And I talked to anybody that would talk to me and just talked. You know, I, I met several people, obviously, I was interviewing for the PhD program. And so I go talk to them, not be obnoxious, um, not go like, oh, I'd love to re you know, talk to you about your work. Just more like, hey, you know, I'm I um, you know, I'm doing this is what I'm doing. I'm working on these papers. I really think I I really would like to work at CU if you guys are going to have any openings. You know, I'd love to hear about them. And about the second or third year I did that, I, I'd walk up to people and they would just be like, yes, Jeff, we know you really want to work here. We're well aware of it. You don't need to tell us about that. What are you working on? And so, so it sort of started off as this very instrumental type conversation, but I wasn't trying to be obnoxious. I was just trying to make clear, um, you know, one thing I learned in the corporate world is like I hired and fired a lot of people. And anytime people were kind of on the margin, uh, and my dad taught me this, actually, uh, the first time I did a job interview, he's like, look, ask for the job. And he's like, anytime you're on the margin and you get to that last part and someone says like, yeah, uh, and you say, do you have any other questions? And I say, yeah, I really want this job. 
Like, is there anything else I can tell you about me that would uh, help you decide if I'm the right person or anything and clarify or tell you about my experience to assure you I am the right person? Now, it sounds really cheesy, right? You feel like you're being like one of these MBAs, like networking at a Bain consulting uh, party or something. But people want to hire people that want the job. Like you want people to want it and be hungry for it. So, so I made that clear. And then I just kept going to that social. And then I, you know, I started to reach out to people about paper ideas I was working on, like not instrumentally saying, Hey, join this paper. Just say, that's what I'm working on. How are things going there? And what are you looking for? And it was really interesting. Cause then I was at um, the SMS meeting and uh, Sharon Matusik walks up to me in the hall, who was professor here is now the Dean at Michigan. Uh, she's like, Hey, did you see our job posting? I'm like, Oh yeah, definitely going to apply. She's like, well, that's good. Cause we pretty much crafted it for you. <laughs> like, and basically it said, we're looking for someone to teach sustainability and entrepreneurship topics. Now at the time there was like maybe three people in the world, like coming out that would do that. Like Sean Hyatt would be one of them. Uh, my co-author and friend Desiree Pacheco, but she graduated from here. So she can't come here. So anyway, that's how I did it. Um, I just kept, I was relentless about it. And it worked out and I've been here ever since. So unfortunately in 2013, we were hit with a massive hundred year flood, uh, <laughs> wiped out many people's homes. And uh, for me, started to make climate change on a personal level, a lot more real. Uh, I was, I was evac, fortunately evac from my home for three weeks. Um, the only way I could get to my house was by hiking because it was, our road was washed out. Uh, I was way for, more fortunate and a lot of people are affected by these events. But, um, you know, that that made this even more real and kind of accelerated my thoughts about understanding environmental problems broadly, but then focusing more on climate change and entrepreneurship. So uh, I study green buildings. I've done a bunch of work on green buildings. Still am today, actually working with a great uh, doctoral student, uh, Beth Embry, who's going to the um, University of Kansas. Uh, she has a fabulous dissertation looking at a bunch of different aspects of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the green building space. Really cool stuff. Um, and uh, some other things about the pandemic and green building. I do a lot of stuff about renewable energy. Uh, the most current thing I'm doing is I'm actually working with uh, Sean Hyatt on a thing about marine energy in the UK, uh, which is fascinating. For those of you in the UK, you're, you're uh, leading the way in an industry that's been trying to find its legs for decades. Uh, it's really just an interesting case because you've got this industry that has had so much support, so much passion, and um, so little traction. <laughs> now, of course, I don't, marine energy people say, we made tons of progress. I'm like, yeah, okay, sure. Um, and then I've been doing some more stuff. This is my depiction of the self <laughs> or what I could find. I've been doing a lot more social psychology things about entrepreneurs at the individual level and how and why people become environmental entrepreneurs and what makes them successful over time. So that's kind of what I do research-wise. And I'm not putting up this. I had to do this for my full package a few years ago. So anyway, um, all of my work is at the intersection or most of my work is at the intersection of these ideas of sustainability entrepreneurship. Uh, you can see almost everything is at that. Actually, I don't know, one paper that's just more entrepreneurship. But, but and then I use institutional theory a lot. I, am, I wasn't trained in institutional theory. There's nobody at Darden that's an institutional theory person. I just was like trying to figure out like a good theory for what I wanted to look at. I don't really care about theories as ontologies or religious beliefs. I think they're tools, not belief systems. I don't see any need to like uh, worship at the church of Scott. You know, I don't know Dick Scott. I'm sure he's a great guy, but you know, I institutional theory is like useful to me is that's why I use it. And if it's not useful, I don't use that theory. Um, don't say that by the way, on the job market, it'll upset people. Um, but that's it. And if you're going to do that and be a weirdo like me and, and not like, you know, focus in, you know, one theoretical realm all the time, or, you know, ascribe to some school, then, then you better have a consistent empirical phenomenon you're interested in. Cause you gotta be consistent one or the other. Otherwise people can't put you in a box and they don't like that. Um, and that makes them uncomfortable. We can talk more about that. All right. So that's what I do. Um, so this brings me to my first actionable insight. Study and write about something you care about. And the reason I told you about all that stuff about me was, first of all, I just, I feel like oftentimes the PhD student, you're looking at these professors with these long vitas and you're like, wow, that's amazing. I could never do that. I mean, like guys, there is nothing, no pathway, no reasonable thing in my background other than loving writing, perhaps 
that would lead me to any success in this field. Like, I mean, I'm uh, I just not, I was a journalism major. Like I even know how to do statistics. Like I took logic in college instead of taking algebra. Like, I mean, it, I just want you to know, like whatever your pathway is to this, there is also a pathway for you to succeed. And I think the best pathway for you to find a, a success is to study and write about something you care about. Um, now that sounds crazy, right? That's like the um, the old thing where you tell entrepreneurs, do what you love. It's not, I, I don't think that's exactly right. I think do what you love, but also um, can do. So sort of the effectuation idea of not just, you know, what should I do? What can I do? Uh, and in this field, um, oh, great. Dean, Dean says the same thing. Interesting. That's cool. Good to know. He never told me that. Anyhow, um, uh, he was on my committee. And like, he never, never told me that. He did, he did call me up and shred my dissertation for an hour and a half with me. That was fun. It's uh, If you ever have Dean on your committee, he'll just call you up. Like, hey, Jeff, Dean Shepard, you got a minute? And then like two hours later, you'll have like realized every flaw in what you've written uh, in excruciating detail. He is an amazing reviewer. Uh, anyway, so um, study and write something you care about because here's the deal. Most of your life and work, unless you're Adam Grant, and probably it's true for Adam Grant too. I don't really know him. So, but um, it's certainly true for Dean, uh, believe it or not, is going to be getting rejected. Far more of your time is going to be spent with rejection than success. So if you're studying something you don't care about, but you think it's the hot topic, which is really bad, trust me, or you just got data or you found someone with a paper you could jump on or whatever, like, those things are all fine if it has to do with something you really care about and you're passionate about understanding more. If you don't, I don't know how people do it. I really don't. Uh, I admire, I actually admire the industry and the, the craft of people that are able to publish on topics that they're not passionate about. And they just say, oh, it's a good context. So I you know, found it. I mean, a lot of people do that and, and um, bless them, they're successful. I don't know how they do it. I really don't. And I think if you can do that, you probably should go work in something where you can make a lot more money like investment banking because you're really, really smart and really not very emotional because because you're tough uh, because most of the time you're going to be getting rejected. So if you study something and write about something you care about, it's okay. Like you're just learning how to do a better job of doing the thing you care about. You're not just facing rejection. Um, although you're still going to face a lot of rejection. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, any questions on that? Thoughts? It doesn't have to be some big social welfare mission thing too. Um, you know, I mean, it, it could just be, look, I, I'm, I'm really passionate about understanding why companies have competitive advantage. And, and but I do think you need to reflect a bit about why would you care about that? Like, do you care about that because you know, you had a family member who owned a small business or worked at a company and lost their job when that business went under or something. I mean, I, you know, it's like, and here, here's one more thing I'll say about this. If you do this, you will be an infinitely more compelling job candidate when you interview at universities. And even if they're not, you're not talking to people like me, if you're talking to people like me, it's, you're going to sell yourself. But even if you're not, even the most instrumental like person in this profession will say, wow, that, that person's really passionate about this. They really care about it and they can articulate why. Um, that makes me more confident they're going to persist and, and, and succeed. Okay, great. Uh, we got some things in the chat. How do you go from what you care about? It's actually, what a wonderful segue, Karen. I'm gonna do that next. Uh, so uh, uh, we'll just wait on that one. Uh, but if you care about research rejection, well, of course, rejections hurt. It sucks. Uh, if you don't care about the data, about the data. Yeah. 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 I mean, I actually, yeah. So, I mean, rejection sucks. I mean, yeah, there's no doubt of that, but, but that's your life. You've chosen. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, people like, like, uh, I'll get into this a little more. I could wallpaper this hallway with my rejection layers. I don't think I have a paper I've published that wasn't rejected somewhere first. Like, maybe one. So we'll talk about that too. Rejection is the path. Um, 
I'm not trying to be like Nietzsche like or something like, but you gotta, you gotta embrace that it's a process and you don't have that much control over it. Um, and this is back to Karen's question. How do you go from something you care about to actually being successful? And I had a, a guy, um, call me up a few years ago, randomly from, uh, from an IV and he was wanting to ask me about it. Cause all of his, uh, all his mentors were mentoring him on how to be successful, but not how to do something he cared about. And he's like, it seems like you've done both. And I'm not saying it's like hubris. He called me and asked me this. So I ended up talking to him for a few hours. How do you know what you love is really what you love? And then you're not lying to yourself. Wow, guy, that's, uh, that's, uh, that falls into the existential crisis realm that I cannot help you with. Um, I think, you know, what we love can change over time. I mean, certainly whom we love changes over time sometimes. I mean, it's, I think you just got to, I mean, love is like, um, here's the thing. Ask yourself this question. If I, if somebody was just going to pay me enough to eat and, you know, enough to have a basic living wage and, um, and I could just write about and study one topic like one general topic, it could be pretty broad, entrepreneurship and sustainability. I think that's, you know, that's precise enough in our field. You don't have to be like, I'm going to study, you know, uh, solar garden development, right? But just a broad topic, would you be content to spend all your time on that? Um, if the answer is no, then you probably don't really love it. Um, that's the best advice I got on that. Uh, crazy makes you change, change gives you success. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Patty's doing the, fail fast and break stuff. That's very bolder attitude. You'd like it here. Um, everybody's like, yeah, I, I think you do have to move fast. Uh, how do you respond to supervisors, viewers, committee pushback, the importance of relevance topic? Oh man, Olaf, I'm sorry. That sucks. Um, yeah, I was there for sure. So at Darden, I remember, um, uh, Sarah's my supervisor, Sarah Sarasvathy was like, I told her what I wanted to do. Uh, actually, I think she only let me in the program because I liked fantasy novels and she wanted to talk to somebody about science fiction. Um, and and so I started telling her about what I wanted to study and do. And she was like, oh, that is lovely. What a wonderful idea. You will never get a job. <laughs> it's like, oh, shit. Well, that sucks. Um, so I really spent like three years like persuading her. Um, I think if you're doing what you love, I think you have to figure out how to make other people care about it too, hence the title there. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, pushing back on them. I mean, the deal is, Olaf, you got to have your committee's buy-in in order to graduate and you need to graduate to get a job. So maybe you have to like, you know, toe the line a little with them. I don't know. I, you know, it's like, I think, I think the, what well, we're going to talk about how to make other people care about your topic. Um, someone once told me publication will absolve you of all sins. The best way to push back on people that are saying what you want to study is not important, not not part of the conversation, whatever. I've heard all this, trust me. I, it does seem like sustainability and entrepreneurship is some like hip thing now, I think. I don't know, I'm, but I've always done it. And trust me, uh, and, and, um, and, and when I started my PhD in like 2005, it was definitely not the hip thing. When I graduated in 2010, it was still like not the hip thing. I Maybe it's sort of is now, maybe it's a hot topic because people are really... People are all like realizing, oh shit, climate change is actually happening. Like, I don't know. Um, uh, you can't plan that stuff. Okay. Uh, you guys feel free. So I don't know if that's helpful. Hopefully this next part. But uh, what I was trying to say is if you really care about something, go get some fantastic freaking data, write a great first draft and chuck that over to your supervisor and say, hey, uh, I'm getting ready to send this off to a journal. I'd love your input. And then all of a sudden they'll care about it. Because it doesn't matter who they are or what they what they're doing, um, publication is the coin of the realm here. And if you are perceived as someone that's going to help someone publish, they will like you. I mean, that's instrumental, but you know, uh, you are not lying. You know, why? Yeah, that's true. I'm not writing obituaries anymore. Uh, thank goodness. Does the rate of rejection reduce at some point in time? No, it doesn't. Uh, actually, um, you get better at dealing with it. Um, there is some learning curve, but here's the problem. Like first round rejection is a flip of the coin. I mean, it honestly is like, 
Now, if you have not written something of sufficient quality for the journal you're targeting, uh, Lika, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, then you're going to get rejected anyway. It doesn't matter. But even if you have written something of sufficient quality for the journal, there are many, many, many factors you cannot control. The editor having a good day or a bad day. Did the, ed, did the reviewers that would be appropriate for your paper just review five papers for the journal in the last year? So the editor doesn't want to ask them again, so they're going to ask somebody new. Um, then when you get to the reviewers, are they up for tenure and it's not going well? Are they getting divorced? I mean, who knows, right? Like, and I'm not saying that our, our process is complete. I, people are always like, oh, the process is so broken. It's unfair. I'm like, oh, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you don't have any control over that. All you have control over is submitting the best work you can. So first round rejection rates, um, I, and for me anyway, uh, do not decrease. Um, second and third round rejection rates do decrease because you learn the process of getting through the review process. So you get better at that. Uh, transformed, oh, that's great. Awesome, yeah, that's very cool stuff. And yeah, I mean, and let the PhD process do let it transform what you love. Like if, if it changes, that's okay. You don't, I'm not saying be this hard headed person, learn from the people around you and try to evolve it link between purpose. And, yeah. Awesome. Love it. Uh, I think it doesn't necessarily go down. You get smarter. You choose. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's, that's absolutely true. Karen. Uh, who did you say to send it to first? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Pay the first round of your paper. Um, I don't know. You'll have to clarify that. Feel free to un unmute and come in. How to overcome the rejection, take as an opportunity. Okay, we'll talk about that. That's going to come up later. I'm, I'm not going to answer questions that I think I'm going to address in the talk. If I don't, then uh, then come back to me later. Yep, definitely have a lot of co-authors. Thanks. Okay, cool. I'm going to carry on because I think I'm going to address a lot of this stuff in the next little section. But uh, if I don't, go at the end, unmute yourself and just go, hey, Jeff, you didn't answer my question. And I'll come back to it, I promise. Sound good? Fair enough? All right. I see if like three people. Okay, cool. Uh, your supervisor. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would, yeah. Your supervisor or another, Hey, if you don't like your supervisor, by the way, and you're not getting along with them, don't stick with them. Um, that's not, it's not a good idea. Like if, I mean, if you have no choice, there's no one else to go work with. Okay, fine. But if there's other people of a similar rank that you have more simpatico with or whatever that you can go work with, I mean, do that. Like, you know, maybe do it after you pass your comprehensive exams. But once you pass your comprehensive exams, your committee is the one that has power over you, not that person that you didn't get along with. Uh, if they're graying your comps, probably don't do it till after that. Hopefully that helps a little. Okay, so I really wanted to study environmental entrepreneurship. I really wanted to care about that. Uh, I also wanted to work at CU Boulder. CU Boulder, JBV is not an A. That sucks. I would like to change it. I haven't been successful in 12 years and change it. Said A minus, B plus, whatever, fine journal. Not going to get tenure published in the journal of history. The only paper at this time that I knew of talking about environmental entrepreneurship was Tom D and Jeff McMullen's, now, in my opinion, classic paper in journal business venture. And I was like, this is awesome. First, I read this paper and I was like, well, they've done everything. What, what, I, there's nothing for me to write on this topic. If you ever feel that way, you're so wrong. I mean, I, it might, if you don't believe me, just look at like my publications. And this paper, like I've, I've, I've cited this paper probably in everything I've ever published. I've written a lot of papers. So nobody's ever said anything. Nobody's ever scooped you and like cut down a path of inquiry. It's actually an advantage for someone to have published on the topic you are interested in. It's helpful. But the Journal of Business Venturing will not get you tenure at the University of Colorado. I wish it would. That'd be great. But it doesn't. That's the reality. You should understand the reality of the institution you're working in. So as a PhD student, I was like, well, this is great. But I need to figure out how to take this conversation and move it over into the top journals. And so for us, the top journals are like the UTD list, basically. It's, you know, AMJ, AMR, ASQ, Management Science, Org Science, SMJ. That's it, you know. I mean, other stuff counts, but you got to publish in those journals. So started to look around for something anyone anywhere had published on this topic. And I found this paper by Mike Russo that was published eight years earlier in SMJ. Uh, the emergence of sustainable injuries building on natural capital. Now, Mike's paper doesn't say anything about environmental entrepreneurship. He doesn't use the word sustainable entrepreneurship. In fact, I think I might have actually introduced him to that term at some point. Like, but it's in SMJ. And so I could, okay. And he's writing about the emergence of industries, which is entrepreneurship. Like, so I'm like, okay, cool. 
I can see what this cat is up to. He's writing, he's writing about things I care about. He's not using the same language, but he's publishing in this journal. And if I can write in the same way, maybe I can publish in that journal and then I could, I could have a decent career. Right. So this is very, you know, for me, it was like figuring out a pathway into the conversation. And by the way, if I go write, you know, this paper in the Journal of Business Venturing and, you know, build on Tom and Jeff's work. Now, don't get me wrong. I was an AE at JBV. I think it's a great journal. I think it's a far better journal, in my humble opinion, than SMJ. But the reality is SMJ counts here for tenure. JBV doesn't. So if I write in JBV, I'm out of luck um, and nobody cares. So I got to figure out how to make the people care about this conversation in these other journals and then I found this paper and this paper totally changed my life because I said, wow, these guys are in ASQ. Now that's a journal I actually like. Uh, and they're distinctly talking about entrepreneurs and sustainability. They're not talking about environmental entrepreneurs, but they're talking about, they are talking about environmental entrepreneurship and they're doing it using this institutional theory. So I literally, when I was writing my dissertation, I literally would go and take Mike's paper and Wes's papers. And then I found like, you know, these other papers by Mike had written earlier. I would take every paper I wrote and I would make it look, I would go paragraph by paragraph, even sentence by sentence and try to write a paper that looked just like one of these three papers. Why? Why? I want to be a creative writer. I want to have sparks of inspiration and write eloquent things. Of course I do. I need to get freaking published. And as a newspaper writer, I understood there is a form to this form of writing. Now, it's a little fuzzier here than a newspaper article, but there is a format that these journals expect and want. And when you're learning the craft, it's good to have a role model. And so this shifted my research question away from just understanding what is environmental entrepreneurship to how does the sociocultural environment differentially impact the entry success and impact of environmental entrepreneurs? I'm still working on that same question today. You know, this is 15 years later. You can write about, if your question is broad, but important to you, you can write about it for your whole career. And I could have written about all the stuff that Jeff and, and, and Tom talk about in the JBV article, but I never would have gotten my papers published, I believe, in the mainstream top management journals if I did that. And then I wouldn't have the job I have. I probably could have a very fine life but I really wanted to work here. And so I love Boulder. I love Colorado. I love snowboarding. I love hiking. I love kayaking. I love everything about this place. I, this is where I wanted to be. So um, that is how, for me anyway, I think this is how for you, you can take whatever you care about and figure out how to get other people to care about because that's really the key. You need to find exemplars preferably that relate to what you're doing and you need to figure out how to horn your way into their conversation and then extend it because if you're not starting your own like fresh conversation is really hard to do now maybe you'll do that maybe you'll write an amr or a theory paper that starts a whole new conversation and then you don't need to write any more papers because you're like ed freeman and you wrote stakeholder theory or whatever i mean it's like our saris and you wrote effectuation like that's really rare, guys. Really hard to do. Uh, and if I was gambling on it, I wouldn't bet on it. Okay, I'm going to go back to the chat. I can't keep up with this chat. I'm going to do the best I can. I'll tell you what. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, Patty. Uh, so many papers with institutional theory bent. Uh, ASQ would be a main one. Uh, org science. Oh, yeah. Ton, yeah, we got put, people are Abrams answering these questions. Tell you what, guys. I, I can't look at the chat and think. So if I didn't answer your question about how to take what you love and translate it into something that other people care about, stop me now. I'll look at the chat, but I'd rather you just ask your question. That's not the only way to do it, but this is absolutely critical. If you're going to study what you love and not make anyone else care about it, you will experience far more of that rejection process I talked about than, than you would otherwise, unfortunately. You have to translate your work into something others can, can understand and care about. And that's why I call finding skyhooks. Find journals, find articles, copy them. How do you find the conversation you join? Um, you take, you look for any and everything about the topic you care about, Rebecca. Uh, so for me, it was looking for, I had to look at every paper about sustainability. I had to look at every paper about entrepreneurship. 
And I started to find these things and I started to find these people. I started to say, wait, now Mike Rusto, that's a guy I want to meet. Wes Sign, that's a guy I want to meet. West Sign students, those are people I want to meet. They're writing about these things in the top journals. Well, if you love many things, you still have impact. Uh, you can, uh, Pia, but it's a lot of work. Uh, I'd suggest you can love a lot of things. I love Dungeons and Dragons, but I don't do research on it. Um, although it would be a really cool research setting, actually. Um, you know, I think you got to, I think you got to call your shot, figure out something you can focus on and do just that for a while. Especially as a doctoral student, because I mean, you know, you got to write a dissertation, you got to get some things published. All right, cool. Um, so I feel like I answered at least as best I can, by the way, this is all the world according to Jeff. And I should have said this earlier. Um, this is all coming from a professor at a um, at a R1 American Research University. And that's all I've ever done. I've only been here. I've done a lot of visiting appointments in Europe and things like that and other schools. I am not making any normative assessment that that's what you should do with your career. If you want to go to a teaching oriented school and you want to publish in journals I've never heard of, you can have a wonderful, great life doing that. And I wish you all Godspeed and, and, and all the power in the world in doing that. I'm simply talking from my own experience. It's not a normative assessment of what you should do. If your goal is to work in R1 University in the United States, and I think my advice is pretty applicable. Okay, let's see. You said random external factors have their input and rejections. How to incorporate the reject reviews as for improvement in your work? I mean, how to know which comment is addressing the issue, which is actually reducing the quality of work? Oh my gosh, Vivek, none of that matters. Um, if it's a if it is a rejection and they're not going to look at your paper again, then my advice to you is to say, what are the things in this rejection letter I can actually do something about in a one month period? For example, is there another statistical test I can run? Is there another uh, control variable I can add? Could I reframe a hypothesis? I would do those things and then submit to the next journal. I don't worry a lot. I mean, you have to do something. You should do some things based on the rejection layer to address, um, but you shouldn't try to parse out which one is helping the paper, which one is hurting the paper. Take a much more instrumental approach of what can I actually do anything about and do those things and then send it to the next journal. And then once you get the R&R, &R, again, this idea of like determining which are the comments I should address, you do everything it says to the extent you humanly can. Again, you just do it. And Dean Shepard absolutely uh, taught me this today. Uh, taught me this today, not today. He taught me this a long time ago. He's like, you just do everything they say to the extent you humanly can. And then you do a couple of more things to address their underlying point. And then you, if you cannot, you explain why you couldn't do it, why it's just not possible. And then you explain what you did to address their underlying point instead. That's how you respond to reviewers. You don't, decide if their comments are valid or and if you when you have an r and r you just do it because your chances just went from like you know i don't know less than 10 percent to 50 50 and so that's a really valuable opportunity you don't want to blow it all right cool okay great i'm gonna carry on please interrupt me though ah so how do you how do you get other people to care about things join the conversation uh, these are uh, Venkat's rules for hypotheses and propositions. Is it interesting? I don't know if it's interesting. It's something that your uh, your grandmother or five-year-old or uh, undergrad students would not uh, automatically assume to be true. Is it novel? If it's already been tested, said, uh, you need to figure out a way to extend that. Is it valuable? Is there some underlying um, reason anyone would care about what you're doing? Like for any reason whatsoever. If so, great. If not, then let's think about, it. we talked about interest to others. And even if you're writing a theory paper, uh, I would suggest making it empirically tractable is a really good way to hone your writing and think about like, could this ever be empirically examined? I'm not saying you got the data on your desktop, you're ready to run Stata. I'm just saying, is there any way in the hell that anyone could ever empirically examine this question? If not, um, then you might've invented the next, um, uh, I'm being recorded. You might have you might have created the next totally ontological theory that will gain huge predominance in your field, uh, or more likely, you've just done something that's going to be hard to uh, hard to publish. 
if you're lucky, you created the first ontological, the next big ontological theory. Uh, and oh, Sarah's won't care. Yeah, ha prove effectuation or disprove it. Good luck with that. All right. Um, yeah, hugely popular. Hi, uh, Jeff. Could you elaborate more about how you integrated the conversations in the three articles you showed? How did how to bring your interest on sustainable entrepreneurship to journals or authors that not openly directly talk? Cool. Great question, uh, Rosella. So um, what you're looking to join is theoretical conversations. So rather than writing a paper about environmental entrepreneurship, um, for example, and green building, I uh, wrote a paper with Mike Lennox and SMJ um, about how, oh gosh, I've written so many sequels that paper. I'm trying to remember it. That one, I believe, is about entry, as I recall, or maybe a different one. I can't remember. Anyway, so I tried to move to more looking at like org ecology arguments around the composition of new entrants and competitors in emerging industries, and then looked at green building in the context of that, and then looked at how did various sociocultural factors impact entry of these entrepreneurs vis-a-vis -vis, um, incumbents. And so that's a conversation SMJ cares about. They're interested in that. I just happen to be talking about, you know, what do I actually care about? I actually cared about like the entrepreneurs starting green building businesses. That's, I didn't really care about the incumbent entry and all that stuff personally, but I wanted to join that conversation. So I had to frame that paper in that way. And I'll, I'll talk about that again in a little bit when I talk about this AMJ uh, qualitative paper. So you're looking for two linkages, two ways to, to link into this conversation. One is context. Mike Russo and Wes Sign are both environmentalists. They do care about the natural environment. Both are business school professors, so inherently they don't think like entrepreneurship is a bad thing usually. Um, so, all right, there's context, right? Most people care about like these contexts. If you're talking about some context that no one cares about ever, uh, perhaps you're being very narrow and you need to think more broadly about your context. Second thing is looking at theoretical like sky hooks for your question. So institutional theory is a big one, right? Everybody talks about institutional theory, but you could just as easily use uh, the RBV or platforms or whatever. Like it doesn't matter. I just, like I said, I just don't care about that stuff. Like, I, is it useful? Um, is the question to ask about the theory. Is it useful? And is anyone talking about it? If you're talking about a theory that's totally like, fallen out of fashion and no one is using it in the journal in the past like 10 years, um, maybe find a theory that's a little more uh, exciting. Uh, hybrid organizing was a great one for me. You know, uh, Julie Badalano wrote that great paper uh, with Matthew Lee and then hybrid organizing, right? I got a theory, talk about, I talk about environmental entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs all day long in the context of hybrid organizing. So you wanna make sure you're having that broader conversation. Hopefully that's helpful to you, I don't know. All right. And this is, this is actually related to that too. The introduction is everything. And um, obviously if you write a great introduction and don't do anything else, then your paper will likely not get published. But if you do everything else and write a crappy introduction, I really would bet against you, man, because like, here's the deal. The people that are reading your papers are extremely busy. They're volunteers that are uncompensated. Most schools don't give associate editors a teaching release. Um, they're doing this because they love the profession. They're doing it because they want the prestige of being an editor. And they're doing it because they're trying to give back to the profession. Those are basically the three reasons anyone's a reviewer, or editor, or a journal that I know of. Uh, or they just love the craft of writing. That could be the fourth one, I guess. So irregardless, um, if your introduction is not clear, concise, and persuasive, you're done because they are going to come to an assessment by the end of those two to three pages that I don't like this paper. And unless you are like extremely like a genius, um, there are reasons for every paper you ever will write to be rejected. And it's way easier to find those reasons. You guys are all trained in your PhD programs how to critique papers. It's way easier to find those reasons than it is to be the advocate for the paper. And so if they don't like the introduction or the introduction is not well written, then you're in big trouble. And this quote just illustrates that. So uh, Jay Barney, as the best recipe for an introduction I've ever seen, 
Uh, all credit to Jay for this. And if Jay if you ever had a chance to see Jay talk about writing, go see it. Uh, he's really a good writer and, and he does a far better this than, than I will. But he uh, he claims that your, your introduction should be no more than two pages. And if you can get to four paragraphs, even better. I don't think you need to hold yourself to that much of a, a standard. Um, maybe at SMJ that's useful, but I think other journals, you got a little more room to breathe. But I think this structure is enormously helpful. And I really, this helped me a tremendous amount. First paragraph, what you're trying to do is to say two things. I know something about a topic I'm going to write about. And that topic is of interest to this journal and its readers. So you always start with some variant of there is growing interest in topic X. And you have like two to three sites about that. And then you're going to say two or three sentences about what we know about your topic. And it should be preferably from the journal you're addressing or a better journal than the one you're writing. in. And it should uh, have very specific, detailed, critical findings that compose what we know about that topic. But don't address the second paragraph. The second paragraph is two to three cents about mysteries or unanswered questions and why they're critical. So, you know, we know these things we talked about in the first paragraph. However, we don't understand this puzzle. And here's the thing, people, people get this usually in their papers. The next sentence to end this needs to be this lack of knowledge, this lack of understanding, this, um, this, uh, this lacuna, if you want to use a you know, $5 word, is critical because it is necessary for some kind of social welfare. It's necessary for some kind of organizational success. It is necessary to understand for some individual's well-being, depending on the level of your paper and what you're trying to do. So not just there's a gap. Everybody kind of gets at this point. There's a gap. I'm going to fill it. That's not adequate. Uh, it's necessary, but not sufficient. Why is that gap important? Why would anyone care? And then guess what your third paragraph does? It says, the purpose of this paper is to fill that gap. That seems really trite and obvious, right? And so there you say, here's what we're going to do. Uh, here's our, our, the theory we're going to develop. Uh, you could maybe have a couple of paragraphs here, and then you maybe summarize the findings and the structure of the paper. So this is what we found. So I follow this. Um, every paper I write, uh, I try to make myself follow this to a T as much as possible. And it is enormously helpful for clarifying and shortening your introduction. I really don't think long introductions are the way to go. Even with the most qualitative and theoretically rich paper, I think you want a short introduction. You want to get right into the thing. Um, okay. Questions about that, about the introduction. How are we doing, Tom? Oh, we're good. Questions on anything? Now I'm at a seminar. Oh, actually, guys, we got to take a break. I got to jump into another seminar. That's what the knock at the door is, I bet. I'm supposed to go tell some people some stuff. Take a break. Pause recording. I'll be back in five minutes. Sorry about How that. How long? How long? Five Jeff? minutes. Five minute break for everyone. I'll be right back. $1,000 dollars to do. I'm trying to give out money to PhD students. I'm the, the research director for our Center for Entrepreneurship. Unfortunately, I can't give it to you guys. But uh, anyway, that's what I was doing. I had to go like pitch to uh, try to give out some money to people. So it's pretty important. I apologize. I had to pop out. I forgot I had to do it. Somebody came and knocked on my door and I was like, you're supposed to be in this meeting. Thankfully, it was on Zoom. Uh, anyway, cool. So let me get back to where I was or, uh, you know, I'm happy just to talk to the rest of the time. I hope. Oh, uh, Brian, I need you to enable uh, sharing for me again, if you don't mind. In the meantime, uh, I'd be perfectly happy to just talk the rest of the time and answer questions, but um, I probably won't do that in the chat. I just want to hear you guys' voices. <laughs> All right, hold on, let me get back to this. I'm just going to share this. I'm not going to bother doing my cool thing. Can you guys see the slides now? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, uh, okay. Let me get the, what's going on. Is this doing this? Is it sharing my whole screen or sorry? Give me just a second. Yeah. Yeah. It's sharing your whole screen. Okay, cool. Let me get back to where I was doing. I've gotten so darn good at the weird thing where I'm a floating head that now I, uh, 
I can't do normal ones. Share. Uh, give me just one second. Feel free to unmute and ask me questions. Tell me I'm full of it. Whatever. Jeff, I, I have a question. On, awesome. Um, yeah, super. Um, when you're problematizing uh, assumptions, so um, taking a little bit more of a, a, a critical, yet gracious, <laughs> but critical approach to the existing literature in the in introduction, when I um, attempt to do that, I feel like it just, it makes the introduction longer. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, it will make the introduction longer. Uh, thank you for your question. First of all, it's a good question. Um, but you have to do it. Um, and so that's why, that's why it's, it's, you know, I've got on here or Jay, I should say, cause I, I just took this straight from him. Um, two to three sentences. You, you really do want to limit yourself and you don't want to Another trap that people fall into often is critiquing the extant literature. I, by the way, are you guys seeing the slide with my floating head now? Is that working again? Awesome. Um, you don't want to do that because imagine, you know, guess who the reviewers are going to be? They're going to be the people that wrote the existing literature. At least some of them are going to be that. So if you're like coming across as like you're attacking them and their work, that's not a great, I think of the reviewers as collaborators, not as my enemy. And so you're trying to engage them in collaboration. So what you want to talk about are puzzles and mysteries that they haven't tried to address necessarily. Oh, and one thing I didn't mention, a great way to do that is one of these two or three sentences could be famous person says, for example, Dean Shepard is wonderful at this dean has written so many like um articles where he lays out like research gaps he'll have like uh, i wrote one in jbv a few years ago um where it's just like literally a list of questions he does that because he's trying to seed the field and give people the i mean you know dean's aware of how influential he is in entrepreneurship like i mean he's not arrogant about anything but but he knows who he is and like he knows if he lists these questions, what you can do. For example, Shepard has written, da, 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 da. It's important to understand this question of why uh, passion and compassion come together in new entrepreneurial ventures. I don't know if he's ever written anything. You know what I mean? So whenever you can end this like problematization or gap in the research with a famous person that's not you saying that it's a problem, preferably in the journal you're targeting, or even, or even better, at a better journal than the journal you're targeting, um, what you're doing is making the review you're, you're taking ammo away from the reviewers because they can no longer say i don't think this is of interest to the journal i'm smarter than dean shepherd and these other other authors you wrote here uh i mean they can if they're a real arrogant jerk in which case you got a problem anyway but but you're trying to give them reasons to say yes is what you're doing here um it's it's pitching it's sales um it really is um yeah does that help Fantastic. Thank you. Sure. It's a great question. Um, so keep it brief, you know, and then you'll go into like more, you, you got to keep it brief too in the introduction because you're going to, you need to go into it again in the uh, theory development and you don't want to bore people. Right. So you definitely want to keep it brief and give it a little more breathing room when you're talking about in your theory development. Okay. And by the way, um, well, we'll get to that. Never mind. Looks like there's stuff happening in the chat. Uh, oh yeah oh god theoretical contributions okay so so badri's got a thumbs up uh can you share your view on what constitutes a theoretical contribution since it seems to be very subjective how can you tell if you have a strong theoretical contribution man i i wish i knew <laughs> it's uh, uh, that's not very helpful to you though it's really hard i mean it is totally subjective um here's one way to do it uh, it, it's what we were just talking about, actually. It's it's showing that the literature did not address the question or puzzle that you are concerned with, that that question is important for both the literature and for practitioners, 
and that you have addressed it. And uh, Sean uh, Hyatt actually talks a lot about this. Um, he's, his, his thing that uh, I've heard him say is like, there's, and I, I would say the same thing. I just, I try to give credit to people for their ideas because I hear them. And I don't want to take them. Without. Sean's, Sean's brilliant. He says, um, you know, there's basically two ways to get the theoretical contribution. One is you are looking at an extant literature and you are extending beyond what we know so far. You're basically adding on a little bit, and it should be a very little bit, onto the extant literature to extend our knowledge and show further paths for future research. Or you're taking two literature streams that don't talk to each other, and you're bringing them together to create new insights. The second one's harder to do, but perhaps more valuable sometimes. Um, how do you know it's a good theoretical contribution when the reviewers and editors are no longer saying, we don't think your theoretical contribution is adequate. What I do, and this is pretty trite. And, and actually I just, I got an r, &R right now where the, the editor is kind of beating on us about it. Actually, I try to see if I have three contributions I can talk about in the discussion. The first two, it's always three guys. Like if you've ever been a consultant, people hold three things in their head really well. Everything else is hard for them. Two doesn't seem complex enough. Three seems like right level of complexity, but not so much that it makes people nervous. It's a trick. Um, the first one is like what I think the actual theoretical contribution really is. And I could show that to you in a specific paper in a little bit here. The second one is something I probably know is BS, but I think I could argue for is sort of a swing for the fences theoretical contribution. Like, you know, we challenge the underlying assumptions of, uh, you know, the research-based view, <laughs> just to have Jay top of mind. Uh, we totally reinvent how we evaluate the process of entry for entrepreneurs. You're overreaching. It's close to the end of the paper though. And it's a gamble because you're thinking they're not going to, what I'm thinking is they're not going to reject the paper because of this. Um, instead, what I'm doing is I'm kind of trying to subtly distract them from my other claims that I actually buy into. So they won't argue with those. Instead, they'll focus on this red herring sort of outlandish claim I'm making that I sort of believe. I mean, I don't just put complete BS down, but I, I do put things down where I'm like, eh, this is a reach. I'm not sure we quite do this, but maybe. And uh, then they hone in on that and then I just take it out. And then my third contribution is all about contribution to the actual world and practitioners and, and uh, how our paper actually helps somebody do something in reality. That's more tactics than it is um, knowing if you have a theoretical contribution or not, but that's the best answer I can give. Uh, I wish I could do better. I mean, if it's something that the existing literature doesn't say or hasn't looked at, but it's almost impossible to argue that the literature wouldn't care about it, then you're in pretty good shape. So for example, I'll use that SMJ paper, right? Um, you know, org ecology has said a lot about how like entry dynamics of, of uh, incumbents and new entrants evolve over time and what implications that has for industry emergence and things like that. And SMJ has published a ton of papers about the strategic drivers of that. But SMJ has never written much about the socio-cultural environment in that for that paper. I think it was 2014. So, you know, we don't want to say everybody that wrote about org ecology and has written about, uh, you know, competitive dynamics at SMJ is wrong. We just want to say, hey, you know what? The socio-cultural environment might also affect this. Um, and so we're going to control for every possible explanation that's previously been in the journal. We're going to show, yeah, you guys are right. Damn, you're smart. You figured this out. Good on you. And then we're going to just show adding these sociocultural factors. Also, they don't reverse the thing or anything like that, but they also matter. So it's really hard for a reviewer to argue coming from that literature like, well, you know, first of all, we don't care about that. Well, okay, then you're just being like kind of obtuse and, and willfully ignorant. Uh, or, you know, the literature has looked at that. It clearly has not. We've shown that in our lit review. And here's a, a recent lit review by Olga Cassina and Glenn Carroll showing nobody's looked at it. And by the way, here's Glenn Carroll saying it matters. Um, so you're, that's how you're trying to set up your theoretical contribution. Not looked at, clearly important, and illustrated by your empirical findings. Okay, hopefully that helps. Great. All right. 
let, let us carry on unless somebody wants not to. Okay. Last thing on writing, and then we'll get into this paper analysis, which is where it really gets in depth. And, you know, if you got to go, you're not going to hurt my feelings. I, I, we all have our lives to live. Um, write a lot, but with intention and persistence. Like you have to write a lot. You need to have a portfolio of projects going. Um, Sarah's changed my life with this. Uh, if you think of your job as publishing, you will lose your mind. If you think of your job as writing well about research you believe is important, you will be very happy. Uh, she really helped me out. I was in a pretty bad mental state during my PhD. Uh, I actually really loved my PhD program mostly, but I really was getting kind of upset. I'm a pretty competitive person. Started to get really obsessed with this idea of publishing in a journal. And uh, she's like, look, man, you're, you're going to make yourself sick and, and you can't do that. You can't control that process. If you can think of your job as writing, which I know you like, and you can write about things you care about, you're going to be happy. And every now and then, you know, that's why this talk is called Unwriting and Occasionally Publishing. Um, and uh, Stephen King talks about this a lot in Unwriting as well, not, not for journal publication, obviously, but he's like, the book can be basically boiled down. People ask him, like, how do you become a writer? He's like, lock yourself in a room and write for five hours a day, every day with no window, and you will become a writer. That's painful and really hard. But yeah, you'll become a writer. So you have to have a discipline of writing. Um, and I mean, and I remember Ed Freeman talking about this one time. He's like, yeah, you guys have this vision. Like, you're going to go out to your house on the lake and there'll be like loons in the background and you'll build a little fire and put on your comfy sweater and sit in front of the computer and have your coffee and have your great insights and do your writing. And that's unfortunately not the life you've chosen. Maybe you're a great writer uh, and you'll write a wonderful novel and and be like Stephen King, God, that'd be awesome for any of you. But really what you've chosen to do is to write in between classes, uh, in airports, uh, on buses, uh, on airplanes, uh, right after you give this seminar. Uh, you just have to make yourself be able, you're, you're far more akin to a journalist than a novelist. You have to just constantly be writing and producing content or think of yourself, uh, you know, in the province today, you're a content producer, like you and, and your job is to have a continuous stream of content that you're getting out the door. So what does that mean? Maybe it's not always the most polished content. Maybe it's not always finished, but you're getting it done and you're getting it out the door. Uh, so I have a podcast. Um, I've learned this firsthand. Um, don't have a YouTube channel, but definitely have a podcast. If you want to check it out creative distillation available wherever podcasts are sold. It's about uh, research being distilled into actionable insights for entrepreneurs. It's a lot of fun. Um, if you ever want to come on, send me an email. I'd love to have you. But that's really, I've really learned that that's super similar to being a researcher. You just got to constantly be doing it. Like if you don't, you lose your audience. And uh, in our profession, if you don't, you lose your research funding. <laughs> so, you know, <clears throat> Professors and colleagues will give you a lot of slack for trying, um, even if you're getting rejected. And eventually, you do have to publish things, but we'll give we give people a lot of slack here. Like if they're submitting stuff, they're getting rejected. That's okay. That's everybody does that. Um, but if you're not submitting, that's a problem. Oh, the podcast is called Creative Distillation. So sort of a little pun on uh, Schumpeter's creative destruction concept. Um, it takes place in breweries and distilleries. So basically we go talk to an entrepreneur, we sample craft beers around Colorado uh, or wherever we happen to be in the world. We interview that entrepreneur and then we have a researcher on and we talk about a piece of research over a beer. Uh, it's meant to be kind of irreverent. Uh, hopefully it's fun. I don't know. We get about a thousand listens an episode. So I guess it's, I, I still don't believe that. They tell me that. I just don't know who these people are and why they're listening to it. But um, But hey, it makes my job fun, so. And seriously, if you've got a paper, we usually do stuff right when it's published. You got a paper, come on there. Uh, thanks, Joel. You're very kind. Uh, give me a shout. We'd love to have you on there. If you can make your way to Boulder even better, or maybe we'll make our way to you. Uh, we actually really want to do more to fe feature uh, PhD students. All right. So here is a really nasty graphic. So what this is, uh, I made this quite a few years ago. Um, this is every paper I had published up until that point. And I stole this graphic from Mike Lennox. I saw him do this at the Babson conference. Uh, my email is Jeffrey, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y 
dot york y o r k at colorado dot edu and i am enormously slow on email um just so you know i suck at answering email ibra could definitely attest to that uh if you actually want to reach me and you have something important uh I, whatever you know just uh put in your email urgent or i think that's what ibra eventually said, important or jeff please help or something i'm just really bad at email i'm, I'm the chair of like two departments i'm a research director I'm not an editor on a journal right now, thank goodness, but man, I just get a lot of email. All right, so um, so this is a timeline, uh, every paper I've ever published, the light blue, well, this isn't every paper, but this is at the time. The light blue are papers that are at a journal. The dark blue is papers that are with me and the red are rejections. Everybody got that? All right, so I will point your uh, attention to the green circle here. So this is when I graduated from UVA. I was really fortunate. I had been I had managed to publish four papers uh, when I graduated, um, one in the Journal of Management, one in JBV, and two in Journal of Business Ethics. Or actually, no, two in JBV, one in Journal of Business Ethics. And those papers went through without getting rejected. Uh, I submitted them. I did the R&R. &R, you can see the time. It was a hell of a lot of work because, as you can see, they're all overlapping. So I'm just going paper to paper to paper to paper. Uh, had a lot of good co-authors, thankfully. Um, I should just type my email in the chat, sorry. Um, and so I thought, you know, I pretty much had this thing figured out. I, I knew how to publish papers. I hadn't published in the top journals yet, but, but no problem. And so I came to CU uh, when I got the job at CU uh, shortly, either when I had got the job or shortly thereafter, I had R&Rs at three top journals. I think I had a, I think I had an, um, uh, AMR and I had an AMJ and a, another AMJ. I think I had two R and R's. I was just like, dude, if I, you know, I'm the guy that doesn't get rejected. So I'm going to crush all these papers and I'm going to get tenure. I'm going to go up early because I'm going to three of these papers and I just need one more. And I'm pretty good. Four A's, I'm pretty good shot at CU for tenure. All of those papers, this this red circle, all of, actually it was four papers. All four of them got rejected within like a three week period all died on the second round and uh that was a real good wake-up call for me <laughs> so i was like ah i'm not the guy that doesn't get rejected it turns out i'm just like everybody else and so then you can see the timeline of where those papers went from there and uh i guess what i want to note is like they all except for that one i guess i can't remember what that one is um they they all eventually did get published, but some of them got rejected multiple times on their way to publication. And it took a long freaking time. And the reason I do this is because I remember looking at Mike Lennox doing this. I'd look at Lennox's CV and I'd just be like, how is that even possible? And I'm the same age as Lennox, but he didn't have like, you know, seven years in industry, he went more or less straight through. So yeah, I, if I, I'll never catch him, like uh, as far as publications, if I, I, like I said, I'm a competitive person, I'll never catch him. Um, but I would look at it and I just go like, shit, like, you know, I mean, how could he possibly have done that? And he showed a graphic like this. And so what I could see then, and hopefully what I'm conveying to you now, is that nobody builds a CV of published work by just sending things through, getting them accepted, and going on to the next thing. First of all, they have a portfolio of work. They're working on multiple projects at the same time. I would suggest around three, three projects, not a lot more because you'll lose your mind. Um, you are constantly doing, actually, um, you can't see my whiteboard, but literally on the top corner of my whiteboard there, it says three papers with a giant exclamation point beside it. There's three papers I'm working on right now. And you do triage all the time. The paper you should be working on is the one closest to publication in the best journal you can publish in. So if it's an R&R, &R, it trumps everything else, right? Uh, if it's very close to being a submission. You should be working on that one before you work on the other ones. Um, you know, get it out of your hands. If over to a co-author, under review, preferably, you know, uh, under under review or uh, uh, second R and R. So then, like, then the triage goes. Well, if it's the second R and R, then that one trumps the one that's the first R and R. And if it's and that trumps and and submissions trump everything versus non-submissions. It's you got to keep stuff moving and you have to have a portfolio. Um, think of yourself like a venture capitalist. Like you got to have a lot of stuff to get one hit. 
it's not a shotgun approach. You're not just doing random things. You're prioritizing your projects and, and committing to triage. And that's how you can actually build a, a CV of work that you'll need to be successful. Uh, I don't know of any other way to do it. Um, jumping on projects because they sound promising, but they're a long way. Doing something with someone because you met them at a conference and you think they're cute. Um, <laughs> these are the temptations. Uh, you don't want to do that. Or you think they're really cool and their ideas are good, but you guys have nothing. And you have this other paper that if you just spent like two weeks like polishing it, you could submit to a journal. Worry on that. And by the way, this works really nicely with your dissertation, right? Because like if your institution will support it, you can do a three paper dissertation. And now you have three papers you're working on until your dissertation's turned in. And once your dissertation's turned in, you, those things, you're just chook, 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 getting them out under review. And then you're on to the new projects. And it's fine to have more projects once you don't have, if, if, I mean, if you, have a, you have three papers and one's under review and you're waiting to hear back from the editors. Now you have these two to prioritize. If those are all good and they're in the co-author's hands or something else, now you can start a new project. <clears throat> but not before, because people, man, I see so many PhD students keep spinning up project after project after project after project and even presenting them at conferences and, and they're doing stuff and they feel like they're making progress. But, but you know, presenting at conferences is fun and great, but it's not what's going to get you tenure. Um, you got to publish. And the only way to publish is to get papers out the door. Um, okay. Yeah, you're right. Uh, podcast is an unconference approach to a conference. All right. Related quick question about the introduction. All definitions must be present in the introduction. I tried doing that and I'll make the introduction too long. I got frustrated. Hmm. That's good. That's a great question. Um, hmm. If you got that many constructs you need to define in the introduction, then um, then that's tricky. Yeah, I would say try to keep it to no more than three definitional things in the introduction. I do think you should define a term the first time you use it, but if it's something that is like just uh, try to use terminology that just makes it apparent what you're talking about. So, for example, I'm working on a paper now where we talk about optimal distinctiveness. Now I could go look up one of um I could go look up a paper and put the definition of optimal distinctiveness. But instead, I'm just gonna put the phrase in, you know, organizations try to engage in optimal distinctiveness to differentiate themselves from their competitors. And I'll put citations to the people that wrote those definitions, but I'm trying to use optimal distinctiveness in a sentence that defines it instead of saying optimal distinctiveness defined as blah, 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 quote, with a, with a site. And then later on in the theory uh, development, you can be more specific and, and make sure you give that very complex definition. That's that's a good trick I would use. Um, determining which ones you can save, that's how I would determine it. I'd determine which, one, which are terms that you could um, just explain in a sentence, or you could just assume that individuals, like, you know, you don't need to define entrepreneur. Uh, I mean, you might at some point explain what you, exactly you mean, but in the introduction, you don't. You don't need to define industry. Um, if you're uh, talking about, I don't know, role identity versus identity, then you probably do need to define what do you mean by a role identity? Um, you know what I mean? So, I mean, it's a bit of a judgment call. Uh, one way to do that is um, get your partner, spouse, um, brother, sister, somebody who actually likes you a lot and will do you a favor to read the introduction and then ask them, what do you think that buy them a beer or buy them a coffee and say, tell me what this paper is about. And if they can tell you what the paper is about with uh, a generally comprehensible understanding that makes sense, you're good. If they can't, then you're probably still using too much jargon or not clarifying the jargon. Uh, ah, Lika. Dedicated to reading. How does one do justice to reading and writing and also well at both enough to buy? Oh man, I'm going to say something so cynical. Um, okay. Um, and I won't give credit to the person that told me this because I'm not sure they'd really want me to. Somebody once told me as an assistant professor, you can read or you can write. And one will make you a marvelous uh, person to hang around at conferences uh it'll give you eloquent insights and sparkling wit and you'll be able to pay service to the profession and really understand the latest things 
And the other one will make sure you have a job in six years. Um, yeah, you do have to read some things. What you do not need to do is read the literature, like just as it comes out. You just can't do that. There's the journals are way too too fast. There's too much coming out. You'll lose your mind. And you got to prioritize writing over reading. How do you do that? You write and then you read the things you need to support what you wrote. And so I try to, when I'm doing a paper, I try to have a set of about 10 to 15 papers that I cut off there that are the papers uh, that I think are core to this project and I'm speaking to. And it's really about five that are really core. And I, I read those five super carefully. And I mean, like, you know, highlight the whole thing, you know, like I'm reviewing it for a journal or whatever. And the other 10 or so, I'm reading the introduction and the discussion. And then I'm looking up stuff in the meantime to figure out. Because really what I'm citing is what the paper did and what the results were. I don't really care about how they developed their theory, did their empirical tests, all that stuff. It, uh, it It's interesting. I, I, again, this sounds so cynical, and I don't mean to come across this way. I'm genuinely trying to help you survive in the profession, not uh, say, oh, just you know, be an instrumentalist. I don't think you have to read everything you cite in depth. I mean, the introduction, ideally, if it's written well, as we've talked about, then you should be able to get what you need out of that introduction as far as what you need to understand about this person's work and what they did and what they contributed. If the introduction is not good, then it probably isn't a very good journal and maybe you shouldn't be spending time with it anyway. So you're trying to have that small range. And so the, the short answer is read what you need to read to support your writing. Don't just try to keep up with the literature. Because um, you know when you're doing your doctoral seminars, your job is to read and read and read and critique. And you know do go read the things that aren't assigned in your seminars that you're passionate about. So for example, no one ever assigned me any of Mike Russo or West Sines papers, but I've read all of them now um, because I had to do that. I had to teach myself my own seminar in those papers um, because nobody was doing that kind of work at my institution. So yeah, you do have to read those to get to a foundation. But I was reading those with a very specific purpose of, I've got these data about green building and about new entrants into green building versus incumbent firms. So I'm going to be reading these papers with an eye towards supporting what I'm going to write about that. I hope that makes sense and doesn't come across as too cynical. I, I love to read. I would I would love to sit around and read papers. That'd be awesome, actually. I mean, not all papers, but <laughs> I would love to read like the latest work by all my friends and everything like that. Um, but man, you just can't do it. So the other cool thing you can do that's pretty instrumental, but helps out your friends who can't read all your work is when you publish something, if you know people that are working, not, not, Keep my eyes. If you know people, like you have some reason to write to them, you, you're not just writing to them out of the blue, but you've met them or you are on a panel together or whatever. Sending them an email saying, hey, we just published this paper. You know, I think it would be of interest to your work. You know, here's a few bullet points about what we found. Send them like three bullet points suitable for citing about your work. That's not arrogant or, you know, or pushy or obnoxious. You genuinely are helping them to help you by knowing what you wrote and citing it. You know, if it's in a good journal, you're helping them because they want to cite work that supports their work. Uh, much of my imposter syndrome. Oh yeah, we all have imposter syndrome, uh, Sylvia. Every every single if if someone does not have imposter syndrome in this profession, they probably are a narcissist or psychotic. Uh, maybe both, and you will run into people like that. Lots of them actually. That's just the way it is. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, you can't. No. Like, do read the paper to make sure what you're saying the paper said is accurate and you are citing them. Yeah. You know, like, hey, you want to cite one of my papers and not read it? Knock yourself out. I'm thrilled. Go for it. <laughs> you have my permission to cite me anytime, anywhere. You can cite me wrong. I don't care. People love to be cited. It's great. It's good for them career wise. Because as you advance through the profession, it becomes not just about what did you publish, what influence is it having? The only measure we have of that is citation rates. So never feel bad about that. Now, citing someone and saying they said something that was completely wrong, like, don't do that. That's not good for your career because they're going to get irritated. But, um, you know, 
make sure you're not doing that. But I mean, I don't think, it, I mean, hopefully none of you would be that so reckless as that because that won't serve you very well. Awesome. Great questions. Hopefully this is useful. This is good. You guys, stuff you guys wanted to talk about? <laughs> I assume so since you're asking questions. Um, if not. It's great. Uh, I have a question. Uh, oh, great. A person I, talking. I, I, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I apologize if I haven't followed you around uh, regarding any books that you've written. But when is a good time for a scholar to write a book? When they're a full professor in our field. Okay. Because, it, I mean, I, again, okay, keep in mind, everything I say is from the perspective of a United States professor and R1 university. So, and that's all I can speak to because that's all I know. I, I, there may be, you may be in an institution that really values books and thinks they're great and is like, Maybe you're in a sociology department for some reason or whatever. Um, you know, it's very different in different fields. In the field of management, um, generally speaking, pre-full professor, um, the question the committee, the tenure or full professor committee or award committee or whatever is going to ask is, why did they spend time writing that book instead of publishing more papers? Because in our realm, what we care about is journal publications. That's the coin of the realm. I've never written a book. Uh, I actually do plan to try to write a book on my next sabbatical, um, but I'm a full professor, so whatever. You know, nobody cares. It's, like, I mean, they still, you know, my dean still expects me to publish in top journals. If I don't do that, eventually I'll start to lose research support and things like that. But no one's. Got, I, I don't have to be. When I'm being reappointed as a full professor, nobody's going to say, "Well, why did he write a book?" I mean, you're, you're sort of you're sort of given the wherewithal to do that uh one exception to that i would say is like editing a journal a, a editing a book of multiple contributions by people on a topic uh that could be that can be pretty helpful um or and writing book chapters is totally fine i just think you uh want to make sure you're doing that um that shouldn't be your main focus it's more something just to get yourself writing get something published better to have a book chapter than nothing published right um, right. but far better to have a journal publication than to have it published. So yeah, again, I, I, you know, I hope I don't come across as cynical or blunt. I I'm just trying to give you guys reality as, as much as I can see it. Um, because I feel like a lot of times you go to the Academy of Management or whatever meeting and people are like up there pontificating and saying, oh, oh, follow your passion, write your book if you want to. I'm like, sure, absolutely do that, but don't expect it to count very much towards your tenure. Um, at least at, at R1 University, they'll be very, very skeptical of that. And the other answer would be uh, if you're just blowing it away, like if you're just publishing at such an elaborate rate that no one, uh, no one's going to bad an eye at your tenure qualification. Sure, write a book. That's even better. Then it's just like a cherry on top. But, uh, but man, writing a book's a lot of work. Um, so, anyway, hope that helps. Thank you. That helped. Thanks. But again, understand the institution you're in. Maybe you're in, like, so I have a, a co-author and friend and uh, she was a, uh, she was a, um, <clears throat> uh, what was her actual, uh, so she wasn't an engineer. I can't remember her exact specialty, but she was an architect basically. And in the school of architecture, writing a book was like the bar for tenure, a book published. And then they have like rules about who published the book. Like it has to be like an academic press. It can't be like an airport book kind of thing. So anyway, but you know, she understood what she was doing. Not great for your profession at business school or your career. Okay, cool. Um, any other questions on publishing generally? What time is it? Oh my God, we only have a few minutes left. I haven't talked about grounded theory. Well, let me let me talk a little bit about grounded theory real quick. And I'm sorry. Um, everything I've talked about is doubly true for grounded theory. <laughs> and that's why I didn't really create a whole different talk. Like, and uh, if you want the best book on this, uh, sorry, I'm just looking for it. Here it is. I love this book. This book right here, Composing Qualitative Research, Karen Golden Biddle and Karen Locke. Great book about how to take your grounded theory project and compose it for publication at Top Journal. Um, get it, read it. Do read books, by the way. Like maybe don't read so many journal articles, but read books. 
like far reaching books about weird ideas related to your topic of interest. Uh, Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything uh, kicked off so many research projects in my mind. Um, it's all about, you know, climate change. And like, that gives you like a lot of really interesting ideas. Yeah, Rosella. Hi, uh, new question. Uh, I, I like this, the suggestion of reading books to expand a bit our ideas and everything. What about lower ranking journals? If one, if I want to publish in top journals, but uh, do I don't think it's the best use of your time. God, that sounds snobby and arrogant. And I don't mean it to sound that way. It's just the reality is if you're reading journals, you don't aspire to publish in mm -hmm. the journals. You probably asp you aspire to publish in published a lot of work in the meantime. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, God, I, I I, I feel like I'm coming across as Mr. Instrumentalist here. I, I let me make it clear. I love what I do. And I, I've never actually, I mean, I can honestly say I've never written a paper on a topic I didn't find interesting or actually care about it. Um, so that's, I think, kind of rare. But uh, yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't advise it. I, I mean, I mean, you know, really, if it's a paper you think is really interesting, just, you know, you don't want to make it like one of the sites you're building on in your introduction because uh, make no mistake, reviewers and editors will look at like who you're citing in the introduction. They'll flip to the back, see what journal it's in. And if it's in a journal they've never heard of, and that's the main driver of your paper, um, I mean, you're giving them reasons to say no is the problem. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Sure. I think actually, all right. So now I feel terribly guilty because I didn't talk enough about grounded theory. Actually, I got time. So I can hang out for another, I can hang out for an extra half hour and I'll talk about this. So let's, let's apply this to a grounded theory journal. I think I talked about publishing and persisting. So um, what I want to talk about are these two papers. Ooh, can I get out of the way? There we go. I see how terribly bald I am. So these two papers, we published one in 2014 in Org Science. We published the other one in 2015 AMJ. And I want to talk about these papers because they started off as one paper. Um, so this is with uh, Desiree Pacheco and Tim Hargrave, uh, two really good writers and good friends of mine. And so we started off this idea of, I understand, how do social movements and industries co-evolve? And we were just thinking about this uh, stuff on wind energy. And Desiree actually came up with this idea. I think it's a brilliant idea, you know, not, not just because uh, we talked about Sine and Lee earlier. So this is a good example of a theoretical contribution, actually. So Sine and Lee scooped Desiree, basically. She was going to write about how social movements influence the emergence of wind energy. And then they published their paper in ASQ. And this was their dissertation day. She's like, oh, crap. Well, there goes my paper. But then she realized you could look at this idea of social movements beyond, because they just write about the Sierra Club in that paper. And there's a lot of social movements beyond the Sierra Club. So she thought of um, the idea of thinking, well, what about how industries could influence the direction of a social movement? And then we saw Desiree and I were talking about this. She was like, this is my idea. I'm like, great. I want to write something with you because I, I, you know, I love you. It'd be great. Uh, so we saw there was a special issue on process studies of change in organization and management, unveiling temporality, activity, and flow. Andy Vandeven was like the editor, I think. And we were like, huh. This this could be a good topic for that special issue, because you know we have these these temporal data. Uh, we can look at the influence back and forth. We seem to be hitting the topics, but neither of us had ever done process, a process study. And we did know Tim Hargrave, and not his son. That's his son hanging out with him. Uh, <laughs> we did know Tim Hargrave. We we'd gone and uh, hung out with him. So a mutual friend of ours. We'd gone and had margaritas somewhere. Although Tim didn't, he didn't drink, but we did. And uh, he drank lime juice or whatever. And uh, we knew we'd like to work with him. And we knew he was Andy Vandeven's student. And so we were like, maybe Tim could help us understand this. So we reached out to him and said, hey, Tim, can you help us understand this? And he's like, sure. So we ended up working together. We submitted the paper to the Academy Management Journal. We got an R&R. &R. So the bright blue was there, came back to us with the dark blue. Uh, we sent it back to the journal. This is one of the many papers that died when I came here. I had this R&R AMJ, you know, bragging about it to my colleagues, like, oh, yeah, I got an R&R AMJ, SMJ, yeah, we're fine, don't worry about it. And uh, it got rejected with, uh, <laughs> the first reviews were, were pretty developmental. The second ones are what I call rejection with, with, with um, scorn. <laughs> like, like, wow, this project screwed up. You guys blew this. You suck, basically, was the rejection letter. 
it didn't say that so badly, but you see how quick the turnaround time was on that second round. Uh, we're like, damn. The big problem we had, I think, was that, or we knew because they were telling us, we had qualitative data and quantitative data, and we were trying to be cool and do a multi-methods paper. Great idea. Some of the best papers ever written. Really, really hard. So what we did is we split it apart and we said, okay, Desiree, you're our quantitative person. You're going to take the quantitative version of the paper and we're going to submit that over to Org Science. Um, Jeff is going to take the qualitative data because what we'd done is we'd done sort of a field study in um, Oregon, Washington, and Colorado of the wind energy industry. And we'd all done, was we were in those three states and we'd all done some initial interviews and I had done a lot more in Colorado. I probably had like 15 interviews or something. And we're like, well, let's just do a paper about, let's go deep with the qualitative data about uh, Colorado and the emergence of wind energy there. And then Desiree is going to do the United States and quantitative data. Makes sense so far? So we split it apart. Comes out of a rejection. Seemed like a really bad time and we weren't sure. So anyway, here's the reviews. Um, Mixed methods. Okay, here's what the reviewer said. The concerns turn mainly around the theoretical contribution. Hey, there you go. Never hear that one, right? And more particularly around problems of misalignment between your dialectical evolutionary theoretical argument and your quantitative hypothesis testing, something that perhaps was latent in the previous version, but comes to the fore in this one. Uh, that's the worst second round review where they're like, yeah, it seemed like it was a pretty good paper, but then your, your revision made it clear how bad it really is. Um, the theoretical qualitative and quantitative dimension of your paper do not presently hang together well. What nice AMJ language. Do not dig hang together well. So we were pretty bummed. So we started this process. And Desiree uh, takes this one. I'm standing in front of it. Desiree was amazingly effective at getting this published. It was really cool. Uh, what she did, and the automation isn't going to work because I'm doing this thing, but, but basically she looked at the adoption of wind energy across the United States and then looked at how social movements, epitomized by this uh, picture of uh, Obama, and if I had the automations, that's the thing, if you've got automations, they won't work when you're doing this mode of presenting. Um, how this kind of uh, injected and co-evolved social movements beyond. So we wanted to understand why wind energy emerged quick, more quickly in some states than others, and how social movements affect the industry, but also how emerges the industry shapes social movements. So we're doing this co-evolutionary model. Now, what we're doing is we're basically taking Sine and Lee and we're just extending it to say, okay, yep, that's true, but what else? And I talked about that earlier. It's like, um, let me see if I, oh man, I, I, gotta get, I gotta get out of this mood. Hold on a second, guys. This isn't gonna work. Um, give me just a second. Basic, I wanna share keynote. Okay, you should just see this deck now. Do you see my whole desktop or just the deck? Somebody tell me. We can see uh, both the deck, but also the like when it's not in the presentation mode. Okay, so are you seeing the deck and like now I'm just off on the side? Is that working? Oh, screen share is paused. Yeah. Why is it doing that? Oh, here we go. Resume share. Okay, what? Sorry, I'm having trouble here. Stop share. Okay. Give me just a second. Share screen. I'm just going to do the desktop. Okay. You guys should see the whole desktop now. Yeah. Cool. Good deal. All right. So now you see the desktop and you see me. And you're seeing a map of the US doing stuff. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Good. All right. Thanks. So where was I? Sorry. Some of the, the, the thing. So, uh, yeah. So, the reason I had the Obama picture, my friend Shepard Ferry, who I went to high school with, not my friend really, more an acquaintance, he's very famous, exit through the gift shop. He did this thing on wind energy. And what he does is he ties to social movements and things. So I was trying to use that to illustrate. So I'm going to click through this real quick and get to the other paper. Sorry. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, here's what we found. So this is Sign and Lee. And then what we did is extend it and say, okay, when the wind energy industry grows, which they showed happens when social movements, specified social movements emerge, then that creates greater visibility for wind energy as an industry, and that creates market incentives. So that's the quantitative paper. 
And I'm going to skip all that. It, we use statistics. It was fancy. Nothing to do with grounded theory. Okay. Here's how you start your grounded theory studies. You take something that might be understood or people might know something about or something you wrote even. And you say, okay, we know this process happens, but why and how? That's what grounded theory is good for. It's not good for demonstrating causality between variables. It's good for getting to the nitty gritty underneath a process to figure out why it happens. So the very first thing with your grounded theory project, you ask yourself, am I asking a paper, a question that should be answered by grounded theory, or am I asking something that should be answered by more quantitative analysis? And so we decided to delve into this Colorado case study with this paper. And this paper, notice how long it took to publish this paper versus the quantitative paper. This was a, a brutal process that went on for a very long time. Uh, it didn't take that much longer, actually. So the question we started with, okay, how, and, and this emerged from the data. That's the other thing with grounded theories. You can't really go in with a research question. You got to go in, and I can't see the chat anymore. So if you have a question, uh, you can feel free to interrupt me or anyone else. Uh, just do that. And then we were going to look at all of these complex questions that emerged from this paper. And this is what you know, I was telling you about how we have those 10 papers. Uh, well, this is what it looked like at the end. These are all the notebooks of papers we ended up reading, uh, response letters, and all of that. Our data was all this stuff. It doesn't really matter for your purposes, but it was a lot. And the other thing I'll say about publishing granted theory research is you're going to have to triangulate. You got to triangulate like crazy. So we have 546 newspaper articles, but then we also have... Um, interviews. And so the interviews by themselves are not sufficient because they're all tinged by perception and recall bias. You can't publish something just based on interviews. Uh, at least I mean, it's very, very rare. You have to triangulate with other data sources that are trapped in time. So they aren't suffering recall bias. So for example, here we're using newspaper articles about the industry in Colorado. And that's telling us like what actually happened at the time and what were the narratives that were emerging at the time as represented by the largest newspaper in Colorado. We have website polls, uh, archival website polls. If you ever want to really suffer, go read a Colorado Public Utilities Commission report. These are all historic documents that are not going to suffer from the recall bias and, um, and the selective retention that these interviews have. What the interviews can do is inform us about how do individuals perceive those events that happen and how do they interpret them now today? So this can tell us about individuals' emotional reaction, their beliefs, the norms they're bringing to the field, but they can't tell us about, you know, this is what actually happened. So we're using these two sources of data for very different purposes in the paper. And this is really important in grounded theory. You need to have multiple sources that you can triangulate by. That could be in vivo meeting minutes you record at the time they happen, and then interviews after that. Um, but you have to have these different sources, I believe, in order to do this properly. Does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, cool. So here's just an example. And uh, you know, here's evidence by source how they came into these first order codes, second order themes and aggregate theoretical dimensions. I'm assuming you guys are familiar with the Joya method. If not, you know, go look that up uh, and check it out. I don't actually, I try very hard not to use it anymore because I think it's become like trite, but I do think it's a good tool for taking, you know, what grounded theory used to be is you would write all these uh, codes on like index cards and then you would organize them on a big table or on a whiteboard or something. And uh, here, what they've done is is kind of made it where you can display those data in a way that people can understand. Um, we used in vivo software. I would use software anytime I'm doing qualitative research because I think it's helpful. That's just some more examples. See, and what we did is like, you know, we show how we use the various evidence to get to the first order codes and the aggregate dimensions. And hopefully, so here's an example, right? You're showing like, well, for one of the, for the top first order codes, most of those came from archival websites. 
But the second ARC uh, codes, those came mostly from interviews. Huh, lo and behold, well, we got triangulation, different sources supporting the same idea as far as the logics, the field level. And I'm not even really talking about what the paper is about because it's an enormously complicated paper. <laughs> so I don't really uh, take too much of our time. I'm trying to talk more about the craft of writing this grounded theory. And then we get to this crazy ass model. You gotta have, if you're talking about theoretical contribution and most, a lot of times this is in particular is a process study. Um, you got to figure out some way to depict what happened so that people can understand the process. Now, I'll just talk about this a little bit. At the bottom, what we have, and it doesn't even matter if you read the paper, I mean, these are historic events. And we talk about each of these historic events in time in the paper. And then we show how that led to different organizational responses that led to field level change. I'm not even gonna get into what it specifically says. And then how it led to the next event. So what we have is this time-based model moving forward. We have events tied to the development of our theory and we're showing how field level change. We drew 50 versions of this model probably, at least. I mean, there were so many versions. And, and, and when you get to this thing at the end, you're like, oh my God, you guys are looking at this with no context, not having read the paper. And you're just like, the hell am I looking at? The model is not supposed to be necessarily intuitive for a reader to just pick up, look at like you guys are doing now and get. It is supposed to be a narrative device that you refer to time and time again. Compromise, reframing, advocacy, hybrid entrepreneurship, and embedding. Those are headings in the paper that are linked to each of these historical events as we tell the narrative. They are the basic theoretical drivers of the story we're telling. So it's very easy when you're reading the paper to flip back and forth between them. That's how you get to a model that actually makes a little bit of sense in theory. And uh, just walk along. So, so those are the three movers. Okay. I talked about persistence in the review process is what I was going to talk about. Round one review, 15 pages of feedback, single spaced. Yes. Just what everyone wants, right? They want clarity on the constructs, concepts, constructs, and data. So define, define, define. We had to make sure to our earlier conversation, everything was clearly defined and differentiated from one another. Is it a process study? Because we were arguing it was a process study and, and, and they were arguing, it seems like you're doing a variance study. Why was that? Oh, I wonder why. Because we were writing a variance quantitative study in org science simultaneously. So we had to get really away from that. We had to say, look, we're not going to look at how one, um, one variable influenced another. We need to look at how at a Colorado field level, which our field was defined as wind energy in Colorado, what happened and how did it create a process of change at that field level? So we also doubled the number of informants. I did twice as many interviews. If you're ever at AMJ and you have an R&R, &R, AMJ is what I would call the show me journal. Every single round, you need to bring new additional data to bear. Again, even if they didn't ask for it. You've got to be going over the top again and again. I would say it's arguably the most difficult journal for me to publish in other than ASQ where I just get rejected every single time. Hopefully I'll change that someday. But anyway, AMJ's tough, man. They, they aren't playing around and they're very demanding. They want to understand the methods and the purpose of the data. That's how we ended up uh, actually uh, showing the difference between these archival data and the interview data. So those were the three things. Their issues were 15 pages. Our response was 40 pages. So give me a feel when you're doing these projects, like, you know, you've got to go over the top. Yeah, we did everything you asked. And then we did these additional things. And by the way, here's examples of them. You really don't want them to have to go back and read the paper. You want them to look at their points they talked about and say, wow, they really addressed that. I don't even have to go really look at it in the paper because I buy it. Now, they're going to go back and look at the paper because they're AMJ reviewers. But you're trying to make it where they're reading the paper and these and, and, and with the grounded theory and qualitative papers, you actually want to make the paper fun to read to the extent humanly possible. What does fun to read mean? 
it means there's a there's characters, there's narrative, there's tension, there's a story um, that people can follow. Okay, uh, questions on that before I move on. So that's first round. I can look at the chat, I guess. Uh, okay. Da, 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 da. Screenshot. Uh, Ashish, uh, newspaper reports are great data source, but they cannot be your only data source. They are a great way to track, you know, what people were thinking at a given time. Uh, all right. Bye, Russell. It's great talking to you. I think she's gone already. Your thoughts on categorization theory? I haven't read Girdle at all, so I don't want to pontificate on something I don't know anything about. Okay. Will the court presentation be available? Okay. Uh, how do you go about getting co-authors? Well, I'm going to talk, I, I told Abra I'd talk about grounded theory, so I want to make sure I meet my commitment here. So I'm going to spend a few more minutes on that, and then I'm happy just to do Q&A. Um, but I hope you're getting a sense for the topic I actually claimed I would talk about is how you persist with a grounded theory project. Um, it is not easy. It's not easy with anything, but yeah. all right. Next one. Hey, we're down to 13 pages of negative feedback. Woohoo. We're doing better. Key ideas are blurring. Uh, we reduced our reliance on the prior literature for theory, but increased our review to position our contribution. I know that sounds crazy. Like what we did is we took a lot of the stuff where we were linking to the theory when we were describing our findings out of there and put it in the lit review. And we cut six pages out of the paper total. Because somebody says your ideas are blurring, you need to make the paper shorter, not longer, and more concise. This was hell. Um, this was a very hard task. <laughs> I did this. I, I remember distinctly, day after day, just trying to say, how do I get, how do I get where our findings are discoupled from theory, but we're still reviewing the theory enough? Um, very hard. Sharpen the contribution. We just uh, clarified our writing. We just, I mean, a lot of this is using uh, one sentence instead of two. A lot of it is using sentences that are one line instead of three. Uh, a lot of it is being super specific and clear the first time and not restating things. And uh, I just talked about that. <clears throat> All the theory went into the lit review and we made the lit review actually shorter. And so what you have, I think uh, this is a really good rule of thumb actually in grounded theory. You have a short lit review of theory in the front end. I'm talking like three to five pages, very short by most standards, lit review. And then your findings are not linking to theory other than the theory you're developing as you talk about them. You're talking about what happened and you're talking about how that leads to a theoretical construct you're going to define. You're not linking it to the prior literature necessarily. You're just telling your theoretical story. And that's what that diagram was I showed you. Then the discussion is long and in depth linking back to how what you said links to extent theory and extent. Does that make sense? Sort of. I mean, this is not something you can jam into a 30 minute talk. I mean, but that's what you got to do, in my opinion. All right, cool. Uh, and here, oh, this is a cool thing. So uh, I'm happy to send this deck to Brat too, so he can post it. Um, what we did is we said, okay, there's three things the editor highlighted rather than um, rather, and this was a big problem. We really highlighted the editor's comments and, and, and we tried to highlight where we talk about the gap in I the prior literature. Can't do What's that? Okay. Anyway, um, the gap, that we where we address it so literally there's no explanation of how logic incompatibility may evolve over time nor be resolved through hydrologic emergence we think this is a gap in literature we talk about that on page five page five in the discussion what we explain is our contribution the relationship between logics evolves through a recursive process between active responses field centralization and logic relationships a hybrid logic may emerge as the result of prior attempts at compromise page 34 successful assimilation page 35 and reduction of field centralization over time, page 35. So what we're doing is we're showing them because we weren't clear where the gap in the literature and our contribution match up, the review and the discussion. This is actually a really good practice in any paper because it helps you really 
show the editor and, and, and yourselves where you're having symmetry about the thing you said you were going to do and explaining how you did it. All right. <clears throat> final, uh, I don't know if there's a final one. We're getting down to six pages now. Uh, <laughs> we think you're talking about hybrid logic versus logic hybridization. We'd like this term better. Great. We like your term better too. Thank you for the suggestion. This is the answer anytime an editor or reviewer suggests a term to you. That's a great idea. We'll use that term. Thank you. Easy, right? <clears throat> Did we oversimplify? We just explained a little more. No problem. Okay. So uh, once again, keep hope alive in the review process, and eventually you can get there. Uh, find a process you care about. Find a theoretical gap you think you can eliminate. Never stop collecting data in the review process for your qualitative paper, grounded theory or not. Keep collecting that data. Keep finding more data sources. Keep talking to your informants to see if their thinking is updated. <clears throat> this gets your thinking sharper, and it allows you to come back to that or saying, yeah, thanks, great. We collected more data to show why that actually is not the case, or maybe you're right. It, excuse me, it is. And keep hope alive. Um, that's the original draft of the paper. <laughs> That's what it looked like. <laughs> and it got there. And then final words of somewhat was this from Ed Freeman. Academia is a pie eating contest where the prize is more pie. And, you know, you write a paper, you publish a paper. Guess what? You get to do it again, you know, again and again and again and again and again. So try to do something you care about and like. Otherwise, you're going to get really, really sick uh, from eating too much pie. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully that's helpful. I will stop the slides. And as I said, I'm happy to share these with uh, Ibrat. And I am happy to talk to you guys for another 20 minutes, actually. I don't have a meeting until 1130. So if it's useful, if you got to go, hey, man, it's your life. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I don't care. Uh, but yeah, happy to answer any questions you have. Don't know where the chat went. Disappeared for me. Oh, it sure. might be worth um, if people could raise their hand, perhaps, so we can see them and invite and have a conversation. Uh, sure, uh, Mariska. Or Mariska. Oh, oh okay. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That was super helpful. Um, um, regarding uh, contribution, uh -huh. um, so I um. I'm working with information or um, suggestions that um, are a combination of uh, Davida Ravasi and what um, people have said Dean Shepard suggests. So three contributions with the first one being your aha that answers your research question, your major contribution, as, as you said. And then um, second contribution, how it's located in the field more broadly. Yeah. And then third always go back to the literature that you borrowed from for your theoretical framing. Yeah. Um, now, when I do that, <laughs> I feel like I'm just repackaging the same contribution over and over. Yeah. Um, sure. And I, I'm sure I'm going to get better at this, but any, any tips would be great. Yeah, I think the way out of that is uh, <clears throat> what you just described. Actually, I would make the first contribution <laughs> somewhat. Um, and I'm trying to get better at this because I feel like what you described is actually really good logic, but I kind of just make that one contribution because like you said, you're saying it over and over again. Um, the second one, I kind of go big. And I think that's what Dean means by situate in the field as like, you know, but I really swing big there. Like we change the implications of this whole field. And like I said, it's probably an overreach. Um, and because I'm always doing sustainability and entrepreneurship stuff, I try to talk about the real impacts as more than like a paragraph I tack on the end um the sort of who cares like and that doesn't have to be about like you know just it's easy with sustainability and entrepreneurship and climate change right but it can it I'd argue it's pretty easy for anything and if it's not then you're doing a weird study that you need to figure out some uh, some more nuance to perhaps uh because like if people if nobody in the world will care I don't know that's kind of depressing right <laughs> Like you don't want to do that. So I don't know if that's helpful, but that's how I think about it. If you're trying to restate it more, um, think about it this way. Every paper is an hourglass. And it gets it starts with the field, starts the narrows to the gap, then narrows to your specific research question, 
then gets even narrower to your like um, your actual results. And then it starts to widen back out. So then it goes. So first contribution, as you said, so here's the answer to our research question. Second contribution, here's how it, how it fills those gaps in the field. Third contribution, here's how it pushes the field even further. So rather than thinking about being a different type of contribution, as Jeff Archer's here, holy cow. Hey, Jeff, how are you? Seen you in so long. Oh, we got to catch up. Anyway, uh, sorry, that's a guy that was in my PhD program. Uh, so um, anyway, um, yeah, man, cool. Okay, hopefully you'll be in Boston. I want to catch up. Okay. So, uh, and then you, um, and then, and then you get to like, you know, the big swinging for the fences, field level contribution guy stuff that they're going to make you take out and hopefully they'll distract them from your other things. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're right. We were, we said too much. You're right. Oh, but this one's really good. Uh, that's kind of how I try to sell it. Hope that makes sense. Uh, Rita or Retta. Yes, thank you so much for such really amazing presentation. I have a question related to You're way too kind. Thank the, you. The, the data collection for grounded theory, because I, I'm working right now on a paper and I, I, I should be working like I will address it uh, using grounded theory, but I've done something with data collection and I want to just make sure that it was right. So what I did, I just conducted like kind of the first round of the interviews. It was like uh -huh. around 40 interviews without starting the analysis. But what I was doing is that after every interview, I make kind of a summary of the interview, like one page summary, highlighting yeah. everything, taking notes. And then I use this summary in the next interview, maybe I change the question or ask about something that I observed from the first interview and so on. Sure. And then continue that process until I finished like 40 interviews. And then I said, okay, I'll stop now, I'll start analysis. And then I would continue later on maybe with the interviews. So. Did I isolate the data analysis that way from the data collection or it's fine since I was taking notes from every interview, like very detailed notes and I'm using it for the next interview. I'm sorry, what is your question? I, I didn't, I, I followed what you said, but I didn't quite get your question. Yeah, the question is, I know that for ground theory, you should not really uh, isolate the data collection from the data analysis. You should do both together simultaneously. Uh -huh. However, I didn't start the analysis. I was just taking like. Oh, that's fine. Things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, so you could like, you could take a, I mean, you know, grand theory is pretty fast and loose. I mean, in all honesty, guys. So, but like, um, yeah, you could just take a bunch of like interviews that happened 20 years ago and you could start your analysis right then, right? And then you probably want to collect some data. I mean, when they talk about this going back and forth between the data and the theory, I mean, that does happen, but it's not some like clean, precise process like running a Stata model or something, right? It's like, I'm collecting data, I'm looking at the literature, I'm working with my co-authors. I think granted theory is easier to do with others, although I have done it alone, but, but, you know, and I'm trying to get to new insights and evolve them over time. That's all they're talking about. Like, that's totally, I mean, in my opinion, that's totally fine. Not a problem at all. Okay, thanks a lot. Sure, no problem. Hope I made you feel better about it because that's I think totally fine. Uh, Patty has her hand up. Oh, it's not related to grounded theory. It's just going back to the question with regards to if they're not, you know, if um, you're looking for co-authors and they're not part of your program, are there, yep. are there recommendations that you have? Yeah. Um, so I, I do have some recommendations on that. I mean, I think you know. I mean, to me, conferences, and in particular, smaller PhD workshops, uh, were the best places to meet co-authors. And, and conferences are great. You meet a lot of people, and you know, you have some drinks, and you know, it's a good time. It's fun. And maybe you meet co-authors that way. But um, you really can kind of get to know people better in these smaller doctoral workshops, like uh, the Babson one, uh, West Coast Technology Entrepreneurship Research Conference has one. Uh, we have one coming up uh, in Puerto Rico at the end of the month. Anybody wants to go, uh, send me an email. Um, I'll see if I have space for you. I have a couple of spaces left. Um, just send me your Vita and a paper you want to workshop. And, you know, hopefully uh, we don't have any funding available or anything. You get yourself to Puerto Rico. It's at the end of this month, uh, beginning of next month. Love to see you there. Um, these are places where you can actually get to know people's ideas and their competency a little better. Because here's the thing is you can really, um, you can really hurt yourself by partnering with a bunch of people that aren't right. productive or helpful. Um, and so here's how to avoid that. In my humble opinion, um, 
if you're working on something and you think you have a good idea with somebody, what I suggest is take it upon yourself to write up like a one page description of the idea and or email, send it to them, say, Hey, you know, I'm thinking about this idea we talked about. Here's my initial thoughts. Just, and what I would do is sort of an outline for their introduction using that Barney formula I sent you. Like that's a good way to start, right? You know, Hey, people are interested in this. We don't know this. We're going to solve, we're going to address it through doing these things, you know, if it's empirical or whatever, and we hope to address the leisure, just write that like a one pager of that, send it to them, say, Hey, if, if you, if you like this idea, would you uh, see what you think about it and make some edits or add to it? If they do that, great. Now they've put a little bit of skin in the game right? and you guys can start going back and forth. And um, this is how I started writing with uh, Tyler uh, Rye, actually. Like we just start, eventually we had email chains that were like, you know, a five page email. We're like, All right, I guess we should make this into a paper now. Um, so that's a really good way to find out, number one, are they going to put any skin in the game? Or are they expecting you to carry the load here? And number two, can they write? Because <laughs> I have had some amazing, um, empirically strong co-authors that just could not write. Uh, and I've also had the opposite and that can be okay, depending on the project, but the best people, people you really want to work with are the people that can do both. Um, and they're rare and exceptional. And Desiree Pacheco is one of them. I've been really fortunate to work with her. She can do any analysis, quantitative, qualitative, whatever, and she can write well and clearly. And, um, you know, those are the people you want to try to find to work with. Now, is every co-author going to have all those strengths? No, of course not. And you're not trying to be snobby. But what you can what can happen is you find this person you like and you find them charming and interesting and funny. And and that's all great. But if they're not going to actually work on the project. Uh, right. Now, on the other hand, if they're an asshole uh, and they really want to work on the project, that's bad, too. <laughs> yeah. Because you're going to spend a lot of time with these people uh, the, and, and, you know, you, you're going to be under duress. I mean, you saw that paper, that's those two papers I talked about. That was like four or five years of our lives together, like talking pretty much every day, Tim, yeah. me and Desiree were talking and, you know, we saw people have sick parents have, have kids be born, kids struggle injuries. I mean, you know, you've got to have that relational process to persevere in these things because you know it's um it's hard yeah so no, i think I if you don't like that. the person if you don't like the person to start with just don't don't even start i don't care how right. good their project is if you really just you know like you don't think you could eat lunch with them and enjoy it right don't do it man it's not yeah. worth it no i appreciate your advice um, sure i hope it's helpful i mean that's what works for me it is our program put <clears throat> Some people in the program to, together with other cohorts, and I did experience where, you know, what someone else of the three I was supposed to be overseeing it, and what they submitted, I I was like, if I had already graduated, there is no way I would even consider partnering with this person. Don't do so it. Then. I just wanted some other context, you know, outside. Cut of your the losses program. quick. Yeah. Seriously, I mean, you, you, I mean, hopefully, yeah. if what you're getting from this is, you know, again. Please, I'm yeah. not making any normative assessment. This is what you should do with your life or anything like that. There are a no, lot of people that are really miserable at US R1 institutions <laughs> trying to do everything <laughs> at the show. There's a lot right. of, I mean, I'm not, you know, no. I mean, I, I'm, 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 I'm being really, there's a lot of people that have driven themselves into serious mental health problems, divorce, um, sickness. I, I'm not saying this is like what you should do. I'm just, right. it's the only thing I know what to tell you about. And if you're going to be doing that, then, you know, I'm not saying be a jerk, but just, you know, go to the person that's not contributing yeah. and you just be like, like I'm sorry, this project just isn't working out for me, or I have another project I need to work yeah. on, or, you know, my spouse just lost their job and I've got to go help out more at home, whatever, you know, make, right. you don't have to, you don't have to beat up on them, make it about you, not right. them. I mean, it really is like dating, uh, quite honestly. Right. No. Although I haven't done that in a very, very good. long time. So. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't good at it to begin with. So. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Great talking to you. Other questions? Got, got a few more minutes here. All right, let's look at the chat. <clears throat> I'm just going to start from the bottom. Does one get review feedbacks about biases if the coding has been done by you alone as a PhD scar? Publishing a journal? Yes. 
like Lika, that is absolutely possible. Um, it's harder to do. Um, but what you must do is uh, triangulate with other data. So you need, um, if you're interviewing people and coding those interviews, you also need to have like in vivo meeting minutes from doing ethnographic work. Um, or you could, uh, or you can look at historical do company documents. You need to have something to triangulate on. Um, another way you could do this is Big Bar or Steel and RA and have them do some coding. Um, and so you can like at least show coder, intercoder reliability with like a reasonable like student or something like that. Um, but you do need to have some way to triangulate and collaborate your findings. But you know, people do usually. Getting a co-author is not a bad way to go, um, in my opinion, depending on the co-author, as we just discussed. Um, sure, my pleasure. Um, okay, let's go down. I'm 40, I'm retired. Okay, okay, that's uh, to me, so I won't read it out loud. Um, sorry. If anybody has any questions, chime in here. You don't even have to raise your hand. Quiet group. I've worn you down after two and a half hours. Hello, I would by. have a question. If sure, I may. go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. I would like to ask you concerning the um, analysis of the secondary data. Uh, mm -hmm. How did you do it in terms of, did you code it in any way? Like yes. the, the volume of the articles that you were speaking about? <laughs> yep, I did uh, that. So, yep, I can talk about that. That was very much my role. Um, so put them into in vivo is what I did. You could use many software you want. And I just start highlighting themes like um, resistance to wind energy, uh, wind um, as an economic benefit, wind as an environmental benefit. Started with really basic things like that. Um, economic arguments, uh, environmental arguments. So I morph into that and that eventually morphed into logics. So you're just reading articles and you're highlighting and coding and then once you've established those those baseline in vivo codes and the words of the informant which is in the words of reporters in the newspaper then you're starting to look at commonalities between them to to move them into those aggregate dimensions um that's that's how i do it um and you know you get faster over time for this particular project i i did the coding it was 546 articles i coded i remember doing it very well um so yeah thank you very much did you have any kind of secondary data that were not in uh, text form and that you consider yes. it actually we did we had um we had a series of videos that the major utility in colorado put out and what i did with that is uh, in vivo actually does have video coding software where you can insert codes at minutes in the videos but i also uh had those i transcribed them and then did code them into uh into uh, text-based data as well um those are great though like especially video they're wonderful uh to have for presenting the paper because you can really bring it to life and be like you know so for example um we had this thing where people were wind energy was starting to take off in colorado but the utilities and the dominant narrative and the field was still it was still expensive and we had this awesome like news report from like the 90s with this guy wearing like his, you know, like total like uh, X-Files Boulder style suit. Like it's very 90s looking. It was just awesome. And he's like, you know, these new wind energy turbines have emerged. And he's like, and he does the whole spiel about what's happening. And then he says, but it'll still cost you a lot more, even if the governor says it won't or something like that. We're just like, bam, that was a newscaster. He's supposed to be impartial. And he's saying this stuff, and it was just a wonderful way to bring the paper to life at conferences and and presentation. And we actually we, and we quoted him in the paper as well. So that guy, whoever he was, new, random newscaster in the '90s, really helped us out. Thank you. Sure. This is it's really fun stuff, guys. I'm actually just getting started on this marine energy thing. Uh, it's pretty fun. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Patty. I'm glad it was the coding, not the session. Oh my God. That's nothing, man. I coded every Colorado public utilities commission report that happened, uh, during the time period we're looking at. And, uh, that was hell. Um, these are the most boring legalese reports. You're just reading and reading going, Oh, I cannot care. Uh, I used to have, a, have a lot of coffee. 
<laughs> and so what what actually happens too in the coding and grounded theory that's useful is once you get to your initial model and your initial like you know uh your 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 codes like what you're looking for and you know kind of what your narrative is and some people would say this is like illegitimate or something i don't i don't buy that at all because we're human beings then what you're doing is you're saying okay now i'm looking for things to support this narrative right or i mean you are still looking for things that are counter to your narrative but really what you're looking for is once you've done like you know once i coded like a couple of uh, like 150 of these newspaper articles, like because it was time based, the thing the narrative was extending. But you know, I mean, by the time I got 150 of them, I had like you know 50 first order codes, and so it's getting much faster now because I'm just hitting these codes. I'm not fine. You know, when people talk about um, theoretical saturation. Um, this also happens in the coding process. You reach coding saturation. There's just nothing more to code. Like you know, you got 250 initial first order codes you know they're going to cover pretty much everything you find there's nothing new under the sun eventually i got time for one more quick question then i gotta run no no well guys um this has been an awesome honor i hope uh it's been useful to you uh, if you're interested in that workshop it's at the sustainability ethics and entrepreneurship conference happening down in san juan um first week of Mar uh, march uh, i think i have I may have two or three slots for PhD students. Like I said, you got to get yourself to San Juan. We're going to have amazing mentors. Um, gosh, you all going to. So uh, mostly my friends, a lot of people. Uh, anyway, it's going to be great. Uh, Sophie Box is going to be a mentor. Jill Purdy, uh, Ted Waldron, Tyler Rye. We got a bunch of really good scholars that are going to be mentoring people there. And it's, uh, and it's in San Juan, so it's not too bad. Uh, will you answer your email? No, I, I'm looking for students. I will answer my email. Send me the paper you want to want to submit to the workshop and your CV. And uh, I can't promise anything, but I will try to get back to you. I'm, I'm supposed to organize the tables uh, today. So I'll know if I have a slot and I'll let you know as quick as I can. It's a lot of fun. And check out the podcast, Gray of Distillation, wherever podcasts are sold. Uh, I, I wanted to ask a question, but maybe you muted me. Uh, so that, go ahead. Ask does question. it mean that when you were talking about the, um, you said you just code and then you look at for something to support what you want to code. So like, for instance, like verification. So it's like you, you can code maybe the transcript and after that you look for the support or the verification in the, the documents to be able to support the, what is in the in transcript. Is that what you mean? No, what I mean is when you engage in your initial coding, you should not be looking to verify some story you have in your head. You should just be coding for things that come up time and time again and categorizing them into some kind of a cognitive map. Um, but what I meant is over time, once you've coded about 100 documents or something, you are going to get to the point where you're not finding new codes. And then you're going to start to craft your theoretical story. And then eventually you're going to be coding to verify that story because now you have landed on what you're actually interested in. Okay. I do not mean to like go into your initial coding thinking I'm looking for this thing. I, that, understand. I, I, I that's not that. a good thing to do. Okay. But so what I you, do mean is when you've coded that number of documents, you're going to have those ideas. Okay. Okay. So maybe you start with the interview transcript, you code all of them. And then you you have like the whole a general idea of what is happening, yeah. Which happened well, maybe with the, you draw the whole thing so it comes to the secondary order, secondary order codes. Yeah. And then you, you so you say you have general idea of what is happening. Then you try to use the the document to verify what you've had. Yes, well something okay. like that. I mean, it's, okay, it's okay. hard to describe. I mean, yeah, that's like, so like. Like just like when you are doing the interview, at some point you realize that nothing, nothing new is happening again. So you just you have reached a saturation point. So you have to stop. Well, you don't have to stop. I would I would urge you to keep collecting data the whole yeah. time. But yeah, but yeah. <laughs> um, Thank you very much. Sure, my pleasure. I hope I have a beautiful you. laugh. By the way, that was that was great. Yes. All right.